barrel distributor. They have the wine barrels from Napa Valley, but they also have conversion kits for the downspout. What they have is actually, you, they give you a drill bit, you drill into your uh, downspout uh, with, a, with a corded drill or cordless drill, then you squeeze this plastic or rubber flange and you put it in and it pops open inside, and when it pops open inside, it uh, collects the water and runs it down the tube, and then that tube comes out into your barrel. You put it down about the level of the barrel. When the barrel's full, the flange then overflows and continues down the, the, the downspout. So you collect all the water until the barrel's full, and so there's no overflow. The flow overflow is still the downspout. So it's a pretty cool little trick. So there's some of those as well. The other company that you may want to know is called Verde, V-E-R-D-E, -E, like green in, in Spanish. Verde, uh, in, uh, I think it's just verde.com or verdebarrels.com. And they have, one, uh, they have the plastic uh, barrels for you. And the plastic barrels are, uh, they actually um, make them themselves. They get barrels from the pickle company, Gedney, and uh, they convert them that way for you. Uh, on the back of this sheet is, if you don't like your pickle barrel because it's bright blue, I gave you some tricks on, I know it's black and white, but I gave you some tricks on how to change the color. So the, co the change the color is you can use plastic outdoor furniture paint. You can paint it any color you like. It holds up really well. One of my favorite techniques that I've done is I've, paint, I've gotten two colors. Uh, uh, the Krylon works great, but you can use any, any of them. I paint the whole thing light green, then I take a fern leaf out of my garden and break it off and I put it on <coughs> and I take a dark green and paint over the top and I've made a camouflage barrel. Okay, so you don't have to, you can have fun with the barrel itself. I love putting it up, the higher you put it up, the more water um, uh, pressure you get out of the barrel. And I like having a large overflow pipe, the, actually the bigger the better. So that when the water comes in, when it's full, it has a way to get out. For instance, yesterday's rain filled up your barrel in about 15 minutes, and it rained all day. So where do you go with that extra water? You gotta have some extra water going somewhere. Um, there are a number of tricks out there that uh, you can do that um, uh, you could, uh, this was my own personal barrel. I actually had the spigot on the bottom, but you could actually put the spigot halfway up in, in, at a higher point and then have a uh, uh, outlet at the bottom with a soaker hose so that you can fill up a watering can from above and then still have a soaker hose or a way to let the water out at the end uh, afterwards. So you can do it a couple different uh, methods. Yes. Where can you get rain chains from? I get mine from the internet so far, okay. still. Um, I know uh, there's a shop, uh, the, the hardware store in downtown um, St. Stillwater has them, mm -hmm. but they're actually more expensive than what you can get on the internet. Oh, um, there's a company local that ha has 50 different kinds of rain chains uh, in Burnsville, Minnesota. Oh, I'm going to remember it eventually. Probably after I leave the class, though. Um, let me think about it. But there's a company local that has 50 different kinds of rain chains, and I will, and I can give you that one as well. But tech, so far, I've gotten my best rain chains off the internet. You just Google it, and it'll come up. Yep, Google just rain chain, Google rain chain, and you'll find a whole bunch. Usually buy them by a 10 foot section, though some companies now can buy them by a foot section. So you just measure how far you need, seven feet. 10 feet is usually enough to get from ground, uh, gutter to ground. Usually you only need about 7 feet to the top of the barrel, but measure it off. Thank you. And, and figure it out. This one I got from the internet, and it's just a lotus cup one. And it looks like, uh, and this is like 6 years old, and you can see it's not losing its color. It's uh, a brass one, so. If, if yeah. it's too short, um, can you like remove links and then put the, the Bells closer together? Yeah, you, yeah, if it's, uh, well in this case, these weren't links, these were already welded together, okay. but I could still take off a couple. If it's too long, you can take off a couple and make it shorter. If it's too short, 
What I, or in the winter time, what I did is when I took the barrel in, I just took a piece of, um, uh, um, a piece of uh, twine and tied to the blast chain and then tied it around the cement block so that the chain's not blown around in the winter and then the rain had froze and went down then into my uh, dry creek bed and down into my rain bed. Do you still need an overflow pipe if you use a rain chain instead of a tube? Yeah, because once the barrel is full, where is the water going to go? Still off the top? You could do it that way. I like to have it. This is my overflow, this pipe right here. It comes in the back, but that's my overflow that goes out. Okay. So I still have my overflow. That type of overflow, you can have a chain of rain barrels too. Right, right, absolutely. So uh, that's the other piece to it is that you can you can start putting. This is a complicated design, but you can get barrels to uh, hook up that way. Or in the case that I in that handout, uh, they are hooked up on the bottom. So. Um, Rain barrels, let's see what else. It, they, they only hold 55 gallons. This is not a solution, um, but it is, uh, could be a key to, your, uh, to the rest of your project as a treatment train, a little bit of that with some other things. I like using the, the barrels just to collect that water for my other potted plants and having a way to, uh, and, and using it for my potted plants and then having that as a system. And I like, you know, as, a, as in my, in my yards, I really like using these beautiful barrels and making it a, a piece of art. What do those cost? Uh, about $120 to $150 for the barrel. And oh, when you get it, uh, you would like, I, I'm going to recommend that you get it in the summer when you can have your windows down if you have it in the inside of your car. Because it, <laughs> it's, uh, you could get drunk by the time you get home. It smells really good. So this one was a, had a Bordeaux wine in it, and it's a, it, it, and you know, the, the other cool thing is it still has the stamp, oh, I, I hit it, there's actually still a stamp of the winery and the barrels from our French oak from Paris, or from France, I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, it's kind of a piece of art then. The Kentucky whiskey barrels are the same thing, they just, you know, if they're just the, the whiskey barrels uh, from Kentucky and they're used, uh, used similarly and they can be used uh, just as easily. So Aren't there's a number of different really kinds heavy, of barrels out there. What? Heavy to ship? I mean, doesn't that cost a fortune? Maybe? Well, so, no, so like uh, Barrel Depot, the Chi goes out and has arrangements with all the, the wineries. When their wineries are done with the barrels, you can't reuse the barrel So for, for wine. So she just loads up a semi truck with 350 barrels, brings them home, uh, makes them into rain barrels, and then and sells them individually. That's why they're only 120, 150 bucks when you're buying in bulk like that. Not bad. Okay. Any other questions about barrels? Rain gardens. Oh, I gotta, I gotta do one thing here. I'm gonna make sure that uh, you can hear this. All right. So, how do they work? We kind of hit that a little bit uh, last week, but I'm gonna do it again, but with a different kind of graphic. The rains come, you have, your bar you have your rain garden, it's a little shallow depression. The rains come, the water comes into your garden and fills up the garden. The sun comes out, the water starts to soak into the ground, and then the birds come out. See, I had to put the sound to it. Pretty hokey, I know, but. So we'll just do it again. Oops, I guess I was gonna do it again. <laughs> Fills up the bear, uh, rain, rain garden. This garden's only six inches deep. Water soaks into that uh, into that medium and soaks into the ground, or evaporates and transpires back into the atmosphere. 
Can you name that bird? That's better, yeah. That's what I should say. Okay, so what that rain garden is, and this is also part of your handout. Every one of these that are hand drawn or sort of hand drawn are actually in your uh, in your packets. So I want to explain how what to be prepared for in doing a rain garden. And to tell you the truth, I give these to homeowners when I'm uh, doing my own gardens. Um, uh, when I'm handing them out a packet, I actually give them this so that they kind of get the understanding of what we're doing. So the I leave a gap here and say the rain garden is x wide and I fill in that number. The rain garden is six inches deep and I fill in that number. And so that they understand that we don't count the mulch, it's where the bottom of the garden is to where the water goes out, that outlet. If it's nine inches deep, you change this from a six to nine. If it's 12 inches deep, you change it from a six to 12, okay? And so you get that understanding of how deep to make that garden. Um, and so what you're doing, though, is the first thing you do is you take out that extra soil, that six inches of soil, and actually you cut out nine inches of soil. You take out three extra inches of soil than what you need. If you need a six inch deep rain garden, you take out nine inches. If you need a 12 inch deep rain garden, you take out 15 inches. And you're going to take that soil and get rid of it. Somewhere on the property, is, if possible, that's the cheapest way. If you can't, find some place to get rid of it. Then once you have that extra soil out, we're going to actually till in three inches of cut. Oh, first you loosen the soil underneath. You're going to double dig. You're going to loosen that soil as deep as you can. And then you're going to put in three inches of compost and mix it all in. We're going to say all that over and over and over again. Okay. So make notes on this as you're coming along. And keep this in mind. Keep referring back to it as we go today. If you have questions, I can show it to you. But this is a <laughs> simple, easy sketch to give you an idea of how to build that rain garden. Okay. How, do you, how do you determine the soil type down below? We'll get to that. Oh, sorry. You're jumping ahead on me. Oh, sorry, sorry. And we have to have some way of letting that water in. So sometimes I do a, a drawing on here. I just draw over the top. And if somebody's going to do a pipe that's underground, I draw that pipe right here out so that you can see where that pipe comes in. Okay? So I just, I use this as a starting sketch and then I can sketch over the top of it. But it gives people an idea of what we're doing. Okay. And I also gave you a checklist. That's actually the very front page of that packet. This is what I gave homeowners to say, this is how you're going to build that rain guard. Step A, the step one, two, three, four, five. So for instance, the first one is start a log book. Get that, you're gonna, if you're going to get money from your, uh, from your uh, doing these, present, uh, from building the rain garden, if you're going to get some kind of a reimbursement, get that log book, keep, it, keep track of everything. Um, and, uh, and sign the contract and do all that. Then, before you start doing anything else, call go for state one. And I even give you the number. Okay. So that you can, and you mark the area so that they can come out and mark that and make sure you don't have any utilities in the way. After that, you're going to then, and I actually have WCD staff, which is Washington Conservation District staff, that's where I used to work, um, but order, uh, order the plants and get, get all that kind of stuff done. And, and I gave them the comments of where to go. If they're having issues, they could call us and give us, a, and I can help give you a hand, but that was... Uh, that's not going to work for you guys as much. But you can talk to your local watershed district, whoever that is. Get that help from them, whoever you're getting the money from. Lay out the garden. I like laying out the garden with a white rope or a garden hose. So you kind of know what it looks like on paper. It always changes slightly in the world. So when you get out there, take a garden hose or a white rope and lay it out and make sure you're OK with it. After that, you cut out the sod. And I'm going to tell you, get a sod kicker or a sod cutter to cut out the sod. It's a rental piece of equipment that's very inexpensive. Then start pulling out the extra soil. Take out three more inches than what you need. Um, then it's, uh, um, if required, um, you might need to put in a retaining wall or other things. Anyway, so you, 
then you get the compost in, mix that in. And then before you do any plants or any mulch, get it checked. Get it all level, get everything set up, and when you think you're close, I'm going to tell you all to stop. Don't put the mulch and plants in and get it verified that it's going to work from the, whoever is the agency that's giving you your money. The reason for that is they're going to verify that it's going to be perfect for you. Okay, have them run out and do a check. If you've never done this before, make sure you do it, uh, have it checked. Make sure you're feeling comfortable about it and that it's working. Because if you plant it and mulch it and it's not right, I don't want you to pull out that plants and mulch to fix it. Most people don't get a very, and what we're going to do, we're going to talk about this, we need a flat bottom bowl. If you have a bowl that's a little off in one direction or other, it's, it's not easy to see. You're only talking about inches. And so it's not always visible. You have to do it by a, um, another a method to check it. I'll get to that in a little bit. Laser level, if you have it, great. I'm going to show you a string method uh, and a few other things. Okay? But we need a flat bottom bowl. Then once you're checked, and I made that a requirement, required to call us and get that checked, then I'm going to say you mulch, you plant, you take pictures along the way, <laughs> you do all that kind of stuff, and then you go get the uh, reimbursement. No, I can tell you exactly how long it takes for a homeowner to build a rain garden. 25 to 30 hours, man hours. But if you're waiting for them to come? If you give them a heads up that you're going to work, they'll come out that day. They'll send somebody out. They don't want to make you wait. Right? If you're doing it on a Saturday or a Sunday, you might have to wait till Monday to plant. But that's the worst case scenario. Okay. They still works without the plants. It just doesn't look quite right. It's not finished. Okay. Okay. Very good. Good question, though. But I can tell you it's 25 to 30 hours. It also costs somewhere around $200 to $500 for a typical rain garden you do yourself. We're not talking huge amounts of money. Great. That's great. No, that's not what I was talking about. I was just talking about materials. I'm just talking about materials. If you have a contractor build that same garden, it'll be 500 to uh, $5,000 depending on who you hire. So I tend to talk people into doing it themselves. Uh, average size is that 100 square feet to 200 square feet. And $500 is when you get the biggest plants possible, gallon pots and bigger, and you put it in a retaining wall. Yeah, worst case scenario. These are not expensive ordeals. Okay. You start getting over 200 square feet, you might get up to 800 bucks. It's not, you know, but you still think about it in the big scheme of things for your front yard, that's not much. You know, and then you get 50% cost share or something like that. Wow, it's a pretty good deal. Do you remember I told you how uh, we did the figuring of math for the phosphorus loads? We did that last time. So in South Washington Watershed District and Valley Branch Watershed District, what they do is they actually, um, they actually figure out the... Um, um, they figure out how much phosphorus is stopped and they give $500 per rain garden. Uh, for, uh, $500 per pound of phosphorus, uh, sorry, $5,000 for every pound of phosphorus that you stop. Uh, for most average rain gardens, it stops 0.1 pounds. 0.1 pounds times $5,000 is 500 bucks. So if you do it yourself, your garden gets paid, is free. You hire somebody out, you get 500 bucks. And the reason why we did that, the biggest reason we did that is you got house A and house B standing side by side. They both take water off of the roof of the house and they have a standard little 100 to 200 square foot rain garden. 
they both stop 0.1 pounds of phosphorus. They're identical, okay? But one person does it themselves for 500 bucks and the neighbor uh, hires the most expensive contractor out there and gets it done for 5,000 bucks. Why did we give homeowner A 250 bucks, half of the cost of the rain garden, and why did we give homeowner B $2,500 for the cost of the rain garden? It's not, it's not fair. It doesn't, and, and so what we're doing is now we're giving money for how much good it does, not by how much money somebody can spend, okay? And by doing that, $500 is 100% of the cost of a little rain garden. That's a pretty good deal. And it's not really that much money to the watershed district. I'm wondering about um, scoring uh, donated plants by doing swapping in neighborhoods. Yeah, that's all free plants. That's great. Yeah. So, and in fact, I encourage you, I encourage homeowners to go, when they go get their plant list, once they have their plant list, you stick to it. But I encourage people to swap with neighbors or family members. I encourage them to go to Craigslist. Craigslist, you won't believe how many plants are in Craigslist in the farm and products section. People are trying to get rid of their extra plants out of their yard. You get them for a buck a piece. Now, you have to be careful. You have to look for the right names and you're going to stick to your plant list. You do not want, you know, if you, if you are doing a sunny garden, you don't want to start getting hostas because they're 50 cents a piece. Okay, so you got to get the right plants, but you won't believe how many good plants you can find on Craigslist for inexpensive. All you have to do is drive somewhere and you get them buck a piece. Well, big deal. That's easy. Okay, so Craigslist also then also keep out for the deals. I actually love people that put rain gardens in in the fall because in the fall you get all the two for one deals. You buy, buy one, get one free. Buy, two, buy one, get two free. Buy two, get one free. All the different sales that are going on at the nurseries because they're trying to get rid of their plants. Isn't it a better time to plant then? Huh? Isn't the fall a better time? Yeah, fall's the best time to plant. You get the best deals. Everything's perfect for the fall. Also, there's a, on Facebook, there's a Twin Cities perennial exchange. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But anyway, that's yep. a good question. Twin Cities Perennial and St. Paul Perennial. They're groups. The other thing is uh, your local gardening club. Your neighbor, if you're in a gardening club or if your neighborhood has a gardening club, keep an eye out for their sales. And the re, uh, landscape revivalist ha is. Um, uh, you can Google this one. Landscape Revivalist, it's sometime early June. They have a big native plant sale going uh, that they do annually over in Rose, Roseville. And the wild right yeah, um, uh, Metro Blooms just finished their uh, uh, Blooms Day and, and native plant sale, but wild ones. Oh, and then of course, keep an eye out for the Friends School plant sale. That's always a good deal. And that just happened on Mother's Day weekend. And then, um, and then Wild Ones tends to have one a little later in the year. So once you start looking for these things, you'll find a whole bunch of places and you can get overloaded with too many plants in your yard really quick. If you need to, if you tell the specific plant list you want and you can only find them a certain time of year or something, what do you do if you're doing a fall planting? Oh, there shouldn't be, you should be able to find anything any time of year if you go to the right nurseries. So for instance, you go to the fall and you're looking for prairie smoke because it's, and prairie smoke's a spring planter, it's, it's blooming right now, or just about to bloom right now. Um, even if you miss it getting it now, most of the Bachman's types nurseries, well first they won't have them anyway, but it, it, those larger nurseries will be sold out. But if you go to the native plant nurseries like Dragonfly Gardens and Landscape Alternatives, and there's a long, long list, and, I, and I'll help you with that list later. They'll have them even into the fall. Now, if you can't find it, you really would like prairie smoke, and you're planting in the fall, and everyone's sold out, it does happen. Leave a hole, plant it in the spring. It's not the end of the world. Absolutely. If you want to if you want to propagate plants from seed 
in your window and get them started, uh, I'm going to recommend that you get them a few inches tall before you plant them in the ground. That works too. I even have tricks for that too if you want to get to that, but we won't do it now. Yes? Uh, your item on, I guess, climb free storage, maybe think a little bit about the main lines that most people have coming out of their house. You have some stairs all the way up to your freezer, but is it, do you think that you need to avoid building on top of the main lines for that reason? So I um, avoid, the lines that I avoid with uh, utilities is obviously the electricity line first and foremost. Most Minneapolis lots are still above ground, but most of the suburban lots are below ground. So water, electricity, shovel, electricity, that's not a good combination. So I avoid those lines. Uh, I tend to also avoid the Comcast and telephone lines because they're only this far under the ground. And in fact, what I tend to do is, <laughs> does anybody work for uh, Comcast or uh, <laughs> telephone line? Um, what I tend to do is I know where it is. Oh, maybe I should turn off the TV for this. <laughs> um, OK, what I tend to do is I, I dig and find the line. And it's really easy to find because it's only under the side. It's barely under the side. Once I find the line. I dig down and I pull up the line and then there's slack in the line and I can pull it and put it back in the ground on the outside of my rain garden. <laughs> or I will find, if I want my rain garden there, or I'll leave it there and put stepping stones over the top of it so I don't plant on top of it. Okay, and leave it right in the, it's not going to hurt anything if water goes on top of it. It doesn't hurt it at all. It's the, you just, uh, you just don't want to break it. Because then they come out and charge you three, four hundred dollars to put it back, and they put it right where you don't want them to put it, right through the middle of the rain garden or something like that. Okay, they don't care. Right. So I was getting to that. So then I don't worry about at all the sewer line, the water line, or the gas line. They are too deep. And when they do service them, they shouldn't be digging up the ground. They should be doing it underneath. The only issue, in fact, in my personal garden in St. Paul, um, when we moved into the house five months later, the septic line cracked and crushed. I had a 1917 Craftsman house, and I had a big silver maple on top of it, and uh, the line was still clay tile, it was the original line, uh, sewer line, and so it just finally wore out and cracked and crumbled, and so it backed up sewer into the house and we clean that out, that's not, a, that's not the big issue, but of course it happened in February. And so we had the guy dig out and in a $4,000 30 yard trench in the middle of my yard in winter so I could put on a new line. And then when he was done, he was putting the dirt in and it's like putting ice cubes in a glass, you have more dirt than you have hole. And I said, when he got there, I said, that's it. Thank you very much. You do not have to come back. He goes, well, I'll come back in the spring and smooth it out and put black soil on it, get the sod going again. I said, don't. Leave it alone, please. And he said, okay. Weirdo. <laughs> he, he went away. And in the spring, the mound of dirt that was this tall sunk. And then I took my, and, and it fit where I wanted. And then I took the a pipe from the house and directed the water into it and I had a rain garden. I didn't have to do any digging. And I have it right on top of that line. I don't worry about it. So, And because they put in brand new plastic, it's unlikely they're ever going to dig it up again in the lifetime of me. But now, that's what I would do. If you're concerned about it, maybe avoid it. But I don't worry about it. I have a question about the boulevards in Minneapolis, like I'm in front of my house, it's not exactly that wide, um, uh, but it's it's somewhat useless sitting there. And so, do you do you recommend or not recommend we, trying to dig down? And we yeah, I give you the exact rule on this. I I helped. Um, uh, we talked about this last time. Okay. Um, you cannot put a rain garden in that boulevard. It's not wide enough. Um, you have all your utilities there. You have your trees there. Uh, and the city of Minneapolis won't let you put a rain garden there because you have to stay four feet from pavement. 
And so four feet from the pavement is the other side of the sidewalk. So what you can do though is you can plant it and you can kind of make a pseudo rain garden. By ripping out the sod, you've already dropped the soil down a couple inches and then you loosen it up and plant it. The water that comes off the sidewalk that goes in there will soak in and you put deep rooted plants. The deal, and there's a, there's a chair right here in front too if you don't mind, if you want. It's up to you. I don't care. It's up to you. Uh, and then I plant it with deep rooted plants. The rules in Minneapolis and St. Paul is you can plant that with plants, but you can't have anything higher than three feet down the main street and 18 inches knee high on the corners. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So, percolation test. This is actually one of the most important pieces of the entire class is how deep do you make your rain garden. In fact, I'm going to tell you it's way more important to know the depth of your garden than it is the size of your garden. We talked about sizing last week and I gave you uh, tools to figure out the sizes of your rain gardens, but I'm going to actually tell you the depth is the most important bit. And on that calculator that I gave you, that bottom one said six inches. This is where you would change that from six to nine to 12, whatever it may be. Okay, first, what you're gonna do is where you'd like to do a rain garden, you dig a hole. And actually, I was gonna do it out here today, but, uh, well, one is I didn't bring my shovel. I didn't have a shovel, but the second part was, but the other part was, I was thinking about when I was looking at out here, it was gonna be, I, we're digging a hole in, in the park and then filling it back in, I just, I decided against it. But I'm gonna talk to you, it's the easiest thing in the world to do here. So you dig a hole about the size of a coffee can. It doesn't have to be very big. And the size of the hole doesn't matter, okay? Si coffee can is about 12 inches tall and about nine inches across. It also just happens to be the same size as your shovel, <laughs> okay? If you wanna do it with a backhoe and really make a big hole, I don't care. The size of the hole doesn't matter, okay? But you do wanna get down to about a foot. And the new generation, they don't even know what a coffee can is, so, okay. Three pounder or one pounder? Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> that's another story. Okay, so. Are you starting at grade first? Start, start at grade. Before you do anything. Yeah, before you do anything else, you, we got to know what's going on. So before we build a rain garden, I want to know how well the soil works here. So you're going to dig a hole about the size of a coffee can. Then I'm going to fill the hole with water. And then... Uh, there's a really complicated engineering tool that you need. It's called a tongue depressor or a popsicle stick or a stick or a toothpick or your credit card. If you use your credit card, though, give me a call. I'll come back and help you out. Uh, so you dig the hole. Bad jokes, I know. Uh, you, and what you're going to do is you're going to put the tongue depressor at the elevation of the water so that the water is touching the bottom of the tongue depressor, okay? So you got your hole, you filled it up with water, you put the tongue depressor in, and then you let the water soak into the ground. And you actually walk away for a very specific amount of time. The specificity on your time is up to you. I tend to go an hour, okay? And then after an hour, you go back out and you measure how much water has gone down. So you measure from the tongue depressor down to the top of the water. And the depth is what you're trying to get, how much water has soaked into the ground in that amount of time. If you've gone out for an hour, what you need to know is figure out how much water will soak into the ground in 24 hours. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the depth and you're going to multiply it by 24, and that's the depth of how much uh, your rain garden can soak into the ground in 24 hours. So, for instance, in one hour, the water soaked in uh, to the ground in a quarter, a quarter of an inch, and you take a quarter of an inch times 24, you get six inches. So you actually make a six inch deep rain garden. That is pretty bad clay soil here in the Twin Cities. That's Plymouth clay. Plymouth has good clay. Just a second. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, if you go out and do it right now, the ground is saturated, especially with the rain and the snow melt. I wouldn't worry about it. 
you are getting the slowest, con the slowest infiltration rate as possible right now if you go do it this week. What if your hole is empty? Now, well, hold on. If you, uh, if you are going to do this in the summer, then I would do it differently. In the summer, I'd fill the hole with water, go to work, come home, fill the hole with water, have dinner, come back out, fill the hole with water. You're not measuring, you're just filling the hole. You're just trying to saturate the ground. You fill that hole up three, four times, then you put in the tongue depressor and measure. The other thing that I'm going to tell you is you don't measure, you don't take a measuring tape and you put it in the hole and measure the depth and let it soak and then put the measuring tape. You don't measure this way in the hole with a, with a tongue depressor or measuring tape. Because when you fill up with the hole with water, what happens to the, the dirt on the sides of the hole? It caves in. Okay? So it changes the depth of your hole. It doesn't, me it doesn't measure that way. So keep it on the top at the surface. Okay? So did I answer your question? Okay. So that's why you're going to, so at this time of year in the spring, I would say no later than June 1st, I would go out, dig a hole, measure, and or fill it and test right away and not worry about it. After June 1st, and I'm just making this up right now, by the way, after June 1st, I would fill up that hole two, three times before I measure. Now, to get to your question, if, you're, uh, if the ground infiltrates a half inch an hour, how deep do you make your, your rain garden? 12, 12 inches. Because 12 times 24, uh, or, uh, a half an inch times 24 is 12 inches. So you're going to make your rain garden 12 inches deep. Now, you have a garden down on Lake Avenue, Bloomington and Lake. In fact, I'm going to tell you exactly where on Bloomington and Lake. Let's go to the uh, Bloomington and Lake, the flower shop on the right-hand side of the road. <laughs> and they want to put a rain garden in the backyard. And you go test the hole, and you dig a hole, you fill it up with water, you put the stick in, and this is the middle of summer, by the way. You fill that hole up with water, and the water soaks into the ground as fast as you can pour it in. You get the ground saturated, you test the water, and it soaks into the ground 10 inches an hour. That's really good sand, by the way. It was easy to dig the hole. So you take 10 inches, you multiply it by 24. How deep do you make your rain garden? To China. You make your rain garden 12 inches deep. Because it'll handle anything you've got. You never go over 12 inches. We're going to make our rain garden 6 inches to 12 inches deep and no more. There's a couple spots over here if anyone wants, if you want a table. Um, the reason why we only make our rain garden 6 to 12 inches deep and no deeper is when you go over 12 a couple things happen. First, it doesn't look right. It looks like a hole. <laughs> okay? You've seen a few of these rain gardens, especially like in parking lots, that they're like two feet deep or four feet deep. What in the world? It doesn't look quite right. And, you, you, and a lot of people go by going, why did they do this? Okay? So it doesn't look right. Second, as soon as you get going over 12 inches, you've kind of made a minor safety hazard. And this is actually a very true story. I built a rain garden 18 inches deep in uh, St. Paul, uh, downtown, uh, downtown St. Paul. Uh, the, it was right in a parking lot for a church and a bar. Okay, so the parking lot was multi-used. And we put this great rain garden uh, near the boulevard, beautiful rain garden 18 inches deep. And, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the gentleman that had, was using the drinking establishment um, at, at 1 o'clock in the morning got, came out of the bar and got on his bicycle. Hey, he wasn't drinking and driving technically. And he rode his bicycle and he decided to cut across that grassy strip over on the side of the bar. Or, I mean on the side of the, of the, uh, of the uh, parking lot. And he went in, he flipped his bike, he landed, he broke his arm, and he sued the city of St. Paul. And he won. That's the piece that kills me. Okay? So now there's a fence around that rain garden in St. Paul for keeping out drunk, stupid people. 
that's my, so there is a minor safety hazard for drunk, stupid people. I, 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 it's a true story. It happened about 04, 05. I'm, I'm, I'm frustrated about it, but it happened. Yes? Do they have DUIs here? I'm sure they do, but he got away with it. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's room on the ends of tables with, so you can write. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the depth of the garden. That's, uh, the other thing is when you go to 12 inches, your plant palette is huge. You go, uh, you go to 15 inches, your plant palette of plants that can handle 15 inches of water or less drops by almost two-thirds. You go to 18 inches, it drops by three-quarters. Okay? Your choice of plants decreases significantly with the number of plants that can handle being in that kind of depth of water. Okay? Yes? Why bother Because you might have clay soils and you might have to go to six inches. Here's the reason for that. We want this rain garden to drain in 24 hours or less. Um, if you're going longer than that, you're tempting fate that it doesn't drain at all. Um, so if you go, if you're, if you have more clay or clay soils or uh, really heavy loam soils, your rain garden will only soak in six or nine inches an hour. That's all the deeper you go. In Kansas City, the clay is so bad that you take it out of the ground and you can model with it. You can make dinosaurs. It's that bad. And, uh, and so in Kansas City, we only make rain gardens two to four inches deep. In Duluth, Minnesota, the red clays of Duluth, Minnesota, we can only make our rain gardens four to six inches deep. Okay? Because we're going to, I told you last time that you can absolutely make a garden in clay, soil, uh, or sandy soils. The soils don't matter. What we're going to do is we're going to change the depth of the gardens. Also, when we change the depth of the gardens, when they get drier, we're going to change our plant palette to fit the type of garden that you have. So we're going to pick more uh, plants that can handle more wet conditions in the gardens that are six inches deep, and we're going to choose plants that can handle more dry conditions in the gardens that are 12 inches deep. Okay, so we're going to change how it works. Yes? The one that you described where the water keeps running right away, why would you put a rain garden in there? Well, because at that place, it was a big patio, and the water was just running off. We just made a dip so that the water has a place to sit and go, soak in the ground and not run off the property. Good question, though. Okay. Okay. So does everyone get this? Do I have to repeat any of that? How to, make, how to know the depth of your garden? So now, now that you know the depth of your garden, that's the number you change on the bottom of that spreadsheet that I gave you last week. You change those four things. The top, the very top one is the number of inches you're trying to collect of water, one inch, two inch, three inch, whatever rain event. The next two are the amount of surface area for pervious surface and impervious surface, and impervious is first and pervious is second. And the last number on the very bottom is the depth of your garden, six inches to 12 inches. Unless you're in Duluth, it might be two or four. Yes? If you're trying to uh, utilize some pump drainage, how do you calculate how much back would be for a rain garden? Um, I am going to assume the sump pump runs pretty quickly and more often than you wish it to. Okay. So you're going to assume uh, you're going you're going to assume that you have uh, you're almost creating a uh, a wetland type rain garden. So I would test the soils, make the garden. Uh, able to uh, or uh, make the garden half as deep as what the soils will allow. So if it's a 12 inch deep rain garden because the soils allow, I'd only make it six inches and make it more surface area because you're putting more water out faster than those sump pumps run almost 24 hours. And so you're going to take more water out. Okay? I tend to do what I tend to do is I tend to put my rain garden uphill and try to dry out the basement so that your sump pump doesn't run as much. Okay. Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. 
Also, when you're digging out that hole, you should actually look at the soil so you can kind of get an idea of what it looks like. If you start squeezing the clay, or squeezing the, the uh, if you can do this to, your, to the soil and it makes a long ribbon, you have clay soils. If you grab the soil and you can crunch it up and it kind of makes a ball, but then it slowly falls apart, you kind of have loam soils. In fact, that's the best soil you want. Sand doesn't compress at all. You can't make a ball. It just kind of always falls apart. Okay? That's really basic soil science for you. <laughs> there is a heck of a lot more to it than that, but that's what we're looking for, is those kinds of things. Uh, silt soils, there is one more category, is silt. Silt is, the amount of silt in, your, in it is, the, is how dirty your hands are going to get. The, dirty, the blacker your hands get from trying to crunch it up, the more silt there is. Okay, it's the, uh, so clay is the finest, silt is the next finest, loams are pretty coarse, and sand is really coarse. Okay? So it gives, and, and then every soil is different because it's got combinations of those four things. <laughs> but it gives you a ball ballpark. It, it, I don't really care what soils you have, as long as it's not peat. If you dig into your ground and it smells like a swamp, don't put a rain garden there, okay? It's already too saturated, too wet, and go uphill from that. That's my only place where I would say don't put a rain garden in most yards. Yes? One inch. We're going to try to capture the one inch rain event. That's that very top line. That's what you always would like to catch if you can do it. Uh, however, I did tell you if you have more space, you can always go backwards and see how much water you can capture. But if you have a minimum capture that you're trying to capture is the one inch rain event. Okay. So now I'm going to walk you through how to build a rain garden. We're going to make, uh, oh, practice calculations. Uh, do, you, do you guys want me to go over that calculator again in any way? Sure. Sure? Yeah. Okay, we'll do it then, quick. Are you sure you put a 24-hour set aside? Oh, 24 hours? The reason for the 24-hour rule is... Uh, you go over 24 hours, you start killing plants. You go over 24 hours, you start creating mosquitoes. You go over 24 hours, you start having a better chance of it not draining at all, and you get a pond instead of a rain garden. Okay. Technically, in the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, it's 48 hours, but I never do that because that's way too easy to um, go too far over. And, um, and I'm going to tell you, there's less and less plants that can handle water for a longer duration of time. What do you say if you go over 24 hours, it begins not working? I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. However you said it. Right. What, what do you mean? It clogs or? No. You, you, no, no. So if you do it, if, if you are allowed 48 hours and you, make, you design it for 24 hours, if it goes a little bit over, yeah. no big deal. It, and by the way, rain gardens get better with age, it'll get faster and faster. If you design it with 48 hours and, uh, in mind, it always, it, if, and it takes longer, you're now at 50, 60 hours, okay. it's now going to kill the plants and it doesn't Not quite work. Not functioning from a, that kind of standpoint. Yep. Okay. Also, remember I told you early last time, an ugly garden is just as bad as a non-functioning garden. <laughs> so when water is sitting in there, that's kind of an ugly garden when it's sitting there for that long. Yes? Yes. No, they tend not to. Well, every district is different. Most will just go out there and visually inspect it and just make sure that with a laser level or something like that, make sure it's a flat bottom. 
and that the, and the, and that the water is going to come in a certain way and have a chance to soak into the ground from your design. If, they, if your design says it's six inches, they're going to verify it's six inches and that it's a flat bottom bowl. Okay? That's what I did. And I, what I also did is I did the, I had a penetrometer, it's a special tool that I could actually feel how soft the soil is. Or you can do the shovel test. You take a shovel and you hold it out and you let go of it and if it sticks in the ground without falling over, it's soft. Okay? So that's a good way of doing it too. I tend to make things as easy as possible. But I, you, I can get it really complicated really, really fast. But I don't want to do that. Not for you guys. Not for anyone, actually. I love engineers how they always try to make it a little bit harder than they need to. They always add another variable. Well, what about this? And what about that? And what about it? So anyway, that's my little dig at engineers. Um, we'll do that calculator quick. You want to see a too big of a file? <laughs> Come on. Okay. So here's that rain garden calculator that we talked about. Um, so what you want to do is you want to make this one inch. And whenever you, that's where you should start. You're going to want to try to capture the one inch rain event. The one inch rain event is your stand, uh, 90%, was it? I wanted to make sure it was on the website. It's on the website, yeah. And, and I hope you've been able to play with it a little bit over the last couple of weeks because I sent it right away. But uh, one, uh, one inch rain event is what you want to capture. The one inch rain event is 90% of the rains that land on our waters in, or on our lands in Minnesota here are one inch or less. For now. Well, yeah, for now. Um, Kansas City, it's uh, 1.25. Uh, they have less rain that we get on an annual basis, but they get more uh, intensity rains when they get them. Okay, that means their rains are bigger storms. So we actually try to capture the 1.25 inch rain event in Kansas City. Portland, Oregon, their water quality event, 90% of their storm events are a half inch. So we actually cap try to capture the half inch rain event in Portland, Oregon. They get rain all the time. They get more rain than we have, but it's, you know, misty, drizzly rain all the time. Okay, it's just different rains in different parts of the country. Here in Minnesota, we're going to try to capture the one inch rain event. Then the other two things that we want to move are these two areas in blue. This is the square feet of uh, per, uh, impervious area that's going to your garden. So the roof, the driveway, things like that. And this is the pervious area, the amount of water that comes off of the lawn and garden areas. And then the last thing that we mess with is this is the depth of your garden. In this case, we said it was six inches deep. So in this example, we have 3,300 uh, 3, uh, square feet of lawn, I mean of uh, uh, roof, 560 square feet of lawn. We're trying to capture the one inch rain event. Our rain garden is six inches deep, so our rain garden should be about 450 square feet. That's it. That? Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah, that, yeah, don't, yeah, don't, that's. I'm trying to figure out the, I remember what the calculation was. Oh, okay, if you want to know that, that's down here in this, this second tab, this is the curve numbers. Okay. So what we did is we figured out that by saying what kind of soil type it is, and is it low density, high density, impervious surface, okay? You can play with that if you want, but I've actually kind of set it up to be kind of Minneapolis. So I wouldn't mess with it unless you really want to start messing. Yes? So if you're looking at the uh, pervious surface of somebody's lawn, what if it is an absolute wooded area that's part of the square footage of the plot? Oh, you, you, okay, so if you want to do, 
if, yes, so if you want to do that, you're going to change this number up here, uh, sorry, change this number up here for the curve number. That's where you're going to go here. So let's say it's wooded lot, forest. The number is uh, for a C soil, which is bad soils, B, uh, 55 to 70, let's just say 70. Then you go over here, you can change this one to 70. Oops. And then what you do down here is then you change that number to how many square feet that is. So let's say it's 1,000. It will make a difference, but not a lot. And, and look how much of a difference it made. One square foot of rain garden. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because that was my other question. Is there, when you sat in there were doing calculations on what the project you were working on, it was like 30,000, uh, like 33,000 square feet. So um, it was just. Well, so if that's, if that's the case, make sure that you go up here and make sure that that says one inch. Yeah. And then verify how big your rain garden is. Now if you're in sandy soils, now watch this. We're going to change this to a 12 inch deep rain garden. I'll change it to 12 and that changes the garden to 2.225 square feet. Well I think, well I guess to me the other point was whether you start at, at some point, again I'm looking at two properties side by side with the total acre which is part of, part of the issue, but um, whether when you start looking at sub-districts and sub Oh absolutely. Absolutely. You, I'm, if you're making one rain garden for two acres of property, you're going to get a very large rain garden. Uh, if you look at breaking that up, that a half acre goes here, a quarter acre goes here, a half acre goes here, it still might be all that size square foot, but the, all the individual rain gardens are going to be much smaller. So you should be looking at the size of the garden. Well, the max is, is, well, how much do you want to dig? Right. Now, the other thing is, just because you should, I'm going to do that back and say it's back to six inches. Just because you may need 450 square feet, I'm not going to suggest that you have to make it that big. As I said, the depth to make it functional is way more important than the size. If you make a 200 square foot rain garden that is six inches deep, you're, gonna, you're not going to capture maybe the one, full one inch of rain, but you're still doing a lot of good. And then you can then go backwards in this also to see how much water that does capture. Let's say you can only make 200 square feet because that's all the space you have. So then you change this number up here to see how much water you actually do capture. Let's say it's 0.5 first. Uh, 186, look at that. It's about 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.55. Uh, so a half an inch of water that you're going to capture, okay? Okay. So play with this. It's somewhat intuitive, um, and it's really just a tool to get you in the ballpark. This is not your rain gardens. If you make your rain garden 450 square feet originally, it's going to be oversized a little bit, but that's okay. I'd rather that you oversize it than undersize it. If that. And the, si and the depth is way more important than anything else. What's the bottom part of the chart look for sewage? Uh, that, that is for when you start dealing with pipes and things. I didn't, I left it there, but I kind of, I kind of wanted to wipe it out. I almost did before I gave it to you. Um, it's really about doing engineered soils and doing, don't worry about that. Okay. Yes. The question has to do with if you have a tree canopy, um, that's going to intercept a lot of the water, especially if it's deciduous trees. Oh, yeah. So then you would basically, rain gardens won't really work underneath the deciduous tree? No, it will. Uh, well, isn't the tree going to capture like 70% of the... Yeah, but we're directing water from other places. Okay, okay yeah. Right. You're right. You're stopping water that's falling directly into the garden, yeah. but you're not stopping the water that you're directing to the rain garden from the roof, the driveway, or other places. And, and if you're, and then that tree canopy, that's where this number gets to be more important, is that you might have a lot of area that you do intercept more. Okay. Okay. Yes. Um, you said in the, um, looking at the pervious areas, you include the existing garden. 
areas of the moon? No, no, no. Oh, yeah, pervious. Yeah, pervious areas. I, it's easier to calculate a large area than a whole bunch of little ones. Okay. So the gardens usually don't, is going to take less water, or will soak in more water at that site. But just consider it lawn. It's just easier. Yeah, just anything pervious go one way, anything impervious. Yeah, because I always just start with them and tell you just end up. It's just easier. Okay. Otherwise, you're trying to calculate smaller and smaller bits. And as I said earlier, keep it simple. Okay, okay. cool. Let's get back to the. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so I also said last time that putting a rain garden on the hill is the easiest place to put a rain garden. And I'm not, I wasn't joking about that. It is actually the easiest place. So if you have a hill and you need to put in a flat bottom rain garden, you dig out this bit of dirt and you, uh, and you, you don't even have to shovel it. You can till it and rake it and you don't have to shovel it. You till it loosen it up and you rake it over here and you make a dam on the downhill side. Okay, so now you're not getting rid of soil. You're keeping it right on site and you're actually using it for your garden. So putting a rain garden on the hill is actually the easiest place to put a rain garden. You'll notice that all my pictures are the same, that these all have flat bottom bowls. It's actually very important to have a flat <coughs> bottom bowl. If this was the slope and you had a dam down here, how much water do you actually capture? You capture from here to that slope and that's it. You capture just a little bit of water. But if you have a flat bottom bowl, you get all that much more area. Okay? Flat bottom bowls are important. Now, do you have to make a flat bottom bowl? If you, if you, act, if you ended up making a round bottom bowl, it's okay. I, you just don't hold nearly as much water. Think of it like a, like a cereal bowl. The reason why a cereal bowl all have flat bottoms is they hold more. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do. So we're going to make a flat bottom bowl uh, and the and level. We'll get to how to level in a second. Also, and when you do it this way, where you make it easier, you keep the soil here. Uh, the other piece to it is when you do have overflows, what you're doing is you're actually drying out the bottom of the hill. Okay. Yes. Do you have a simple way to, to figure out the depth of that you're going? So you dug your hole. So you came here, you dug your hole, you've tested the water, you get a nine inch deep rain garden. So that we're going to make a nine inch deep rain this way. So what you're going to do is you're going to measure from here to the bottom of the garden get nine inches because that's where the water is going to go over when it's too full. That's your outlet. You measure from your outlet. Your outlet could be anywhere on the garden. Where the outlet is, you measure from there to the bottom of the garden. That's your depth. And in fact, that's what this next piece is right here, is the depth of the garden is equal to the removal of the soil to the, where the water goes out. That's the bowl. Yes. Outlet is where the water leaves when you, ha when it, so you know in your bathtub when you have too much water, there's that little hole in your bathtub that lets the water out? That's your outlet in, that's the high outlet, not the drain, <laughs> that's the high outlet. It's the same thing with this, it's that safety uh, release valve. The low spot in the, uh, in the ground where the water flows out is where your out, where, is, where your ring, where the, when you have too much water where the water flows out, that's the outlet. Inlet is where the water comes in. Outlet is where the water goes out. Sometimes, sometimes you physically make an outlet. Sometimes you have a natural one where it already is. So that's kind of the depends question or answer. But does that make sense? Okay. Okay, cool. So how did you determine that outlet? So we have your inlet, the water comes in over, over the ground or out a pipe, and you have your flat bottom bowl. What you're going to do is measure how deep that depth is by measuring from here to here. The easiest way to do that, well, the easiest way to do that is with the laser level. 
if you happen to have one. But I guarantee you most of you don't have one. Uh, I have one in, the, in my car at all times, but I'm a little bit of a geek. So uh, the other way to do it is to do it with a string level. This little string bob uh, is uh, 90 cents at Ace Hardware. <laughs> okay. What you do then is you put two stakes on either side of your garden. And you tie the string between the stakes and the string is, uh, you put the bob in the middle and the string is level when the, bo when the bubble in the bob is in the middle. So then the string is perfectly level. Okay. Then what you're going to do is you're going to measure the distance from the string to the ground where the water goes out, and let's say it's 12 inches, and then you measure the, from the string to the bottom of the garden in a couple spots, and let's say it's 18 inches. 18 minus 12 is 6 inches. Your rain garden is 6 inches deep. Okay? Does anybody not get that? Yes. Yeah. I just raised where that level is. So what I've done is instead of running the string on the ground, I've raised the string up so it's not in my way. It's the same thing. Oh yeah, that's another story. When we go to take the soil out, when you're taking the soil out, you're gonna have, you're gonna take out three more inches. What you're gonna do is you're gonna measure from here to here and here to here and it better be nine inches extra. And then when you uh, put the compost back in and mix it back in, you're gonna put three inches of compost in, then it should come back up to six inches. How do you know what the slope is supposed to be? What angle of what slope? Oh, on the sides here? Mm -hmm. Yes. The angle of that slope on the sides should be uh, uh, three to one, or in one foot it should drop three feet. Or, sorry, in three feet it should drop one foot. Okay, so that's maximum steepness. Now, with that said, I don't care. If you want to make it steeper, that's fine. What what the three to one is is that if somebody steps in there, you get you kind of take a, a little lunge, but you won't fall down <laughs> in six inches. If you have it where it's more of a step, you could trip somebody up. The other thing is, if you put a retaining wall in on this side, and you make it really vertical, you actually get more water. You hold more water. So I don't really worry about that as much. What I also tend to do is, when I spray paint the yard, uh, I'll do it this way. Since I'm stuck on purple, we'll do it that way. If uh, um, Here's my, and my outlet goes that way. Oops. <laughs> uh, um, what I, if you, on, on this side, when I'm looking down on the garden and I spray paint my garden, and let's say I, I do a, a kidney bean shape, and that's what you see from above, so I've spray painted the edge of my garden, I will also then, if I want to do three to one, um, and you have six inches deep. If you go in a foot and a half in, I might spray paint another line right here and say that is the bottom of my garden. So I'll spray paint two lines. One is the outside of the garden, one is the bottom of the garden. And if it's six inches deep, you go a foot and a half in. If it's a foot deep, you go three feet in. That's three to one. So when you're sizing the garden, are you going by the outside line or the inside? Outside line. line. Don't bother. Yeah. It's oversized slightly already, so I won't worry about it. Do the outside line. Again, it's back to keep it simple. When you can't regrade the property so that the outlet is lower than the inlet, then you can't put it in there. 
Correct. You're making a pawn somewhere. Right. Which... Right. Right, and you might be might have to if that's the case. If you're kind of up in both directions, you might have to put in a pipe in the garden that outlets somewhere downhill, wherever that may be. We'll talk about that in a minute, but that's that's another way. It's called a standpipe. And then the standpipe is the height of the standpipe where the water goes into the pipe is the depth of your garden. But that has to have some place to go. It, has, it still has to have some place to go. Have to be the to take it right. So that's going to be some expensive. No. Not horribly expensive. It's more expensive, but not horribly expensive. You can usually trench something for 50 bucks to 150 bucks, depending on how far you have to go. 150 bucks, not much, if you do it yourself. As soon as you hire somebody, it's a little different. And if you're going to do it yourself, you get a trenching tool. You go and rent the trenching tool, and you just go, and you're done. None of this. Work smarter, not harder. Okay? Yes? Rotor tiller has a whole bunch of tines that are mixing up the soil. A trenching tool actually cuts the dirt out and throws it to the side and actually makes a trench. Yeah, it's a yeah, it's a it's a dirt snowblower. It's it's called a ditch witch. It's actually called a ditch witch. Yeah, that's another name. That's the that's the brand name. Just like Bobcat's the name for a skid steer, Kleenex is the name for a facial tissue. Ditch witch is the name for a Trenching tool. Okay, cool. Okay. Okay. So we're going to walk you through a rain garden. This is a Minneapolis lot. And in fact, this is the one that um, we, I showed last week, I th or last time, I think. It's the, the aerial photo was uh, the property, and uh, my nose is itching like crazy. I don't know what the deal is. Um, it's the, uh, it's not allergies, because I'm not allergic. It was an aerial photo from last week, uh, if you still have your stuff from last week. Ah, oh, there we go. That's got to be better. Um, the, uh, the, uh, it's the one that was in, on 50th and Minneapolis. Maybe. So, here's the, here's the deal. Um, the first thing that I do is put down my rope. So we, we've kind of calculated where I want it and how big it's supposed to be. Now it's time to actually do the work. So the first thing I do is I, get, I use a nice white rope because I can see it. And I, I lay it out and then I look at it from the windows. I look at it from the, the parking or from the driveway. I look at it from a number of angles and make sure this is the shape I want. The next thing that I did on this specific thing is change the shape. Because the first thing I did is I turned this rope out this way and I turned this rope out that way. So that when you're mowing the grass, you don't have these funky little triangles that you have to try to figure out how to mow. Okay? So think about the lawnmower. Okay? So lay, out, lay it out. Once I had it laid out, I tend to spray paint it. But you don't have to spray paint it and just start digging like we did here. We actually started cutting it and moving the rope as we went. So this is a sod kicker. What I like about a sod kicker is it's $15 and it is Rusty powered or Amanda powered or Troy powered or whoever is pushing that darn thing. What it is is it it's, looks like a plow. It's got a little wheel on it and there's a bar back here. You set it down where you want to go and the bar, you kick the bar, hence the name sod kicker. Kick the bar and it moves about two feet. You take a step forward, you pull it back an inch, you kick the bar and it moves about two feet. And you just keep going. And what's great about it is that you actually have a cut of sod perfectly able to be rolled up. In fact, you roll it up. Okay? You can get a sod cutter, 
They're twice as expensive. They're four times heavier. And you have to figure out how to get it in your car and out and back. Okay? These things are so small, it's not worth it. You can cut the sod with a sod kicker in about 10 minutes. And you can do it with a sod cutter in five minutes. What's the use of five minutes for $30 more? Right, and 600 pounds. So the sod kicker is a much better tool. And it's only $15 for a day. You'll never use it that long. Okay. Now that you've rolled up the sod, you can now use the sod for other places. Or you roll it up in a logs. You go out to the front street. You stack it up like cordwood. You put a sign in it that says free sod. You go into the computer and say free sod at this house address. First come, first serve. Do not talk to me. You have to add that last bit. So that when people come up, they take the sod away, and they don't come up and say, what are you doing? Because otherwise you'll spend a half hour explaining what you're doing and not getting your work done. Okay? If you want to do that, that's fine, but I tend to ignore people. Well, yeah, yeah. So, or maybe you should say, come talk to me. I don't know. So what's up to you? Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, that's a good way of getting rid of sod, and it's going to a good home, hopefully. Okay, once you got the sod picked up, next thing you need to do is uh, start digging it out. So you're going to go in there and start digging out the uh, soil, and you're going to actually take, uh, over dig the soil now, or double dig the soil. So what you're going to do is you're going to over dig. If you, uh, we have already said that, if you want six inch deep ring garden, you pull out nine inches. If you want a 12 inch deep ring garden, you pull out 15 inches, you take out three more inches. Once you've taken out that, so that extra soil, and you're getting close, then you uh, add the compost back in. Now here's a little math uh, bit for you. If your rain garden is 100 square feet, how much, uh, how much compost do you need in a cubic yards to put in to get three inches? No, it's not very much at all. Okay, so what you do is you do, if you want 3 inches, 3 divided by 12 is 0.25. So you take 100 square feet, you times it by 0.25, and now you have cubic feet. And now you need to go to cubic yards, so you divide by 27. So here's the math for you. You take the square foot of your rain garden, you multiply it by 0.25, And divide by 27. That's 3 inches. 0.25 is 3 inches. Quarter of, a, quarter of a foot is 3 inches. So what you're doing is you're trying to get the volume. Okay? To get it to cubic yards. Because when you order compost or mulch, you got to do it by cubic yards. Yep. Now, here's the last piece. How much compost, if you need three inches of compost, how much compost do you need for that same rain garden? Reverse. The same amount as the, so if it's, a, so if you have, uh, if you need a half a yard of compost, you need a half a yard of mulch. Okay, when we'll get to that in a second. It's the same calculation. So once you do the calculation once, it's the same amount for both. So compost ordering, um, can you also get compost manure from Kearns, or do you just get straight compost? You can get compost manure, but I don't, I don't, I don't see that as a benefit. Okay. And here, the reason for that not being a benefit is it's usually richer, and we want it poorer in material. We're putting the compost in for the health of the plants, but we're not trying to make super plants. Okay? We want healthy plants that are going to grow there. We don't need to be putting in extra manure or extra fertilizer ever because we're not trying to grow produce. Okay? Yes?
Not sidewalks. I don't worry about sidewalks. Okay. Patios and uh, uh, I don't even worry about patios. I worry about driveways and porches and garage floors. Anything that has that, 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 has that, that uh, a foot of, of aggregate underneath, class five. Under a sidewalk, it's so thin, I don't worry about it. Your rain garden's deeper than the class five. on top of that. So then you put the three inches of compost on top. Okay, so what you're going to do, you're not counting the mulch. So what you're going to do is you're going to take out the nine inches of soil. Now we're going to double dig, meaning you have to loosen the soil up 12 inches or more the depth of your shovel, okay? Or if you have a tiller, the depth of your tiller. Then I get the compost and I put that in and I mix it back in. So I have a nice loose soil, but I don't want a layer of compost. I want the compost mixed into the native soils. So tiller is the ideal. I is great. Again, that's back to work smarter, not harder. However, a pitchfork goes so fast in here because you've already loosened it up. Okay, so what I do then is I pull out my nine inches, I then go the depth of my pitchfork, loosen up the soil, or a tiller, about nine inches to a foot. And if you go back to your little sketch, that's how that is. You, got, you pull out the nine inches, then you loosen up underneath a foot, then you put the compost in, and you mix that in. Three inches of compost and mix it in. So that the final grade is back to six inches deep. So that all makes sense? Well, mulch is next. I'll get to mulch in a minute. We're just doing a compost right now. So okay? if you loosen the soil, I mean you're fluffing it up, doesn't that take up some of our space? Too? A little bit, but not a lot. Not a lot. Yep, you loosen everything. <laughs> Might as well, you're gonna, you got to plant it in it anyway. Okay? So loosen it all up. Make it as loose as possible. And the shovel test is the best trick. Drop the shovel. If it sticks, you're good. Okay. So you've loosened it up. And uh, now you've got to grade it out. You're going to get it level, level bottom. You saw how black the soil was when we dropped the compost in. You see how well we mixed it in. It just kind of made a dirty soil. Okay. We level it off. Then after you got it level and you're feeling good about it, what you do is you get out your laser level and you test the depth. <laughs> Or you get out your stakes and test, test the depth. The outlet was uh, under this fence. It was already going there, so we let the outlet continue to go that way, even though it was going onto the neighbor's property. If it wasn't already going there, I would not allow it to go through the neighbor's property. Okay? However, now the neighbor is getting much less water going to the neighbor's property thanks to this rain garden. Then what we do is we measure here at the outlet. The water was going this way, so we measured it. And you can see that it's about here. It looks like it's about two, almost three feet deep. Uh, or t from the, not three feet deep, three feet from the, where the laser level is to here. Then I go inside and I measure the bottom of the garden, so it should come up six inches and be up like right about there. Yes. Yes. I try to make it wider than a foot, and I don't care how wide it gets. The only reason why I try to go wider than a foot is when we get torrential rains, that it's not going fast through that spot and potentially causing erosion. I don't really worry about erosion across grass. I worry about erosion going over my dam that might be soil. Wow, that's a long time ago. I had a full beard at that time. <laughs> My nose was still big, though. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> and then we mulch, then plant. I always mulch first. Here's why. 
I always have a whole bunch of us planting. I never plant by myself anymore. I can't remember the last time I just planted by myself except for, you know, a couple plants in my own yard. Okay? I always have a group of people. So if they're stepping in my rain garden, I don't want a whole bunch of feet in there compacting the soil. So the, I put the mulch down. And, I put, and then also, by putting down the mulch, I get a perfect three inches of mulch across my garden before I start to plant in there. Okay? So, I always mulch, then plant. However, I'm going to give you a trick when you go to plant. You plant your biggest pot first. You move the mulch, you plant your biggest pot, you keep that pot, you push the mulch back, you go to the next plant, you take uh, all the mulch and put it into your, uh, into your uh, or you push the mulch away, sorry, push the mulch away, you take the dirt out, you put it into that big pot that you just have, dig the hole, plant the plant, dump the dirt in, move the mulch, go to the next one, keep going. Now, if you want to plant, then mulch. It is okay. There's no steadfast rule, but I'm going to give you a trick to that as well because you still want even mulch all the way across. And a lot of times you're planting plants like this that are plugs and are only this big. You're going to bury them. So this is the trick. You plant the, you, you plant the plant, you take the empty pot, you put it over the plant. You plant the plant, you take the empty pot, put it over the plant. When you have your garden full of upside down pots and you've planted all your plants, you can throw the mulch in and you're not going to bury any plants. When you're done, you just pick up the pots. Mulch, then plant. And the reason why I do that is Again, it's back to I always have a ton of people. I always have a ton of people. And it goes faster. So if you have baby plants and you're, you have three inches of mulch and you need to get the plants into the dirt, you're just creating a, a dirt circle, an area of you're pushing the mulch back away from the plants. You're not going to bring the mulch back quite so fast. Yeah. Yeah, you don't want to bury your plant in the mulch. You, you, it gets pretty close, but you got to get some green up there, otherwise it's not going to grow. Yeah. Does that mean that we bear it? No, never. Never, never use a word bar barrier. My own personal experience on this. So you can use one if you like. I never use one. It doesn't work. After a while, it just stops working and you have weeds coming in anyway. So when you pull the weeds out, it pulls the barrier out and pretty soon you're ripping it out anyway. Uh, what happens is the seeds come onto the, onto the mulch and they grow through the mulch and they put the roots through the barrier and then when you pull the weed out, you're pulling the barrier out. It's not worth it. Uh, most, of the mulch, uh, most of the plants, um, uh, uh, most of the weeds are in the mulch and they pull out really simply with fingers not a scoop, so I've always had it easier that way. And the, and the mulch is there for weed control more than anything else and holding moisture during uh, dry times. Uh, the mulch will decompose and decay over time if you use, uh, and that's the next piece, uh, the mulch that you use is a double shredded hardwood mulch. Double shredded hardwood mulch. The reason why I use hardwood, not softwood, is that it lasts longer. It takes two years before it dissolves and goes away. If you use softwood, it decomposes in about a year or less. I also use double shredded and not wood chips. Wood chips float away. You lose about 60 to 70 percent of them in the first rain event and go downhill. Shredded doesn't float. And the reason for it is it's run through a different machine. Chippers come through and they chip them off like potato chips. And they don't have any rough edges. Well, they don't have very rough edges and they float away. The shredded mulch goes through a different machine that it gets ripped apart. And it gets pulled apart and has all these frayed edges. The frayed edges grab the other frayed edges of the other mulch and it holds it in place. Even though it could float technically, only 5% floats away the first rain event and none of it floats away <coughs> anymore after that. So it, it prevents it from floating away. I don't use cocoa beans. Uh, they float away everywhere. I don't use straw or pine bark or pine needles. They all float away. 
I also don't use rock. Even though rock doesn't float, I don't use rock for a totally different reason. Rock is dry and hot and provides no nutrients for the plants. Okay? And what I want is this stuff to actually decompose and create organic for the plants. It's like adding long-term fertilizer. The second piece is, once the plants get established in two to three years, you don't have to add any more mulch unless you really want to if you've planted it uh, thickly, like a cottage garden. When the plants are starting to touch, you don't see the mulch, why add mulch? There's no reason for it, unless you have an aesthetic reason. If you plant it differently, if you plant the plants where they're separated so you can see the mulch on purpose and the plants get the perfect shape, that's a totally different kind of gardening, which is fine, then you will have to add mulch in the future. The style of the garden is still up to the homeowner. It's not, it, that's all that matters. Okay, yes? So if you're putting the uh, partial walls, you would, you would line them with one big fabric to fill the spaces? Right. When you, oh yeah, when I didn't talk about a wall, the wall happens when you're digging before you get into compost. So you've, you've dug your garden, you put up your wall, you've leveled it off, then you put, and then you put up the, in the compost. So you're factoring that into your measurements. You're that into your measurements. If you're putting up the wall, you absolutely have to put landscape fabric behind the wall to keep the soil from going through your wall and dirtying up your wall on either end. Same if you have it on the downhill side too, if you do the terrace. With, um, in your picture with the slope, you showed a berm. Yeah. Um, how high can you go on a berm and, and, and make it stable? You can go as high as you want to make go on the berm, but what I'm going to suggest is that you stomp on the berm and compact it so that it's less likely to erode. If you're going to let the water go over the berm, you're going to want to put something over that to protect it, like some rock, little fabric and rock, or a little piece of landscape fabric, or something like that. But I told you last week that I want the water to go around my berm, not over the berm, if I can. Yeah. So more weeds. So, yeah, 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 I know what you're talking about. So, so here's my tricks for you. First, I kind of pick yards to put rain <laughs> gardens in that the care is going to happen. Doesn't mean it's not a weedy garden to begin with. If you have a weedy yard and you can put a rain garden in, and the people are going to take care of it, not a problem. But if they're not going to take care of it, I kind of, I kind of avoid those gardens. Okay, first. Second, if you get a weed problem in your garden, and we're not talking about maintenance yet, but this is a good time, and that you get the, the, the full gauntlet of dandelions or those bellflowers, my trick for you is to go after it with an herbicide. And the herbicide I would use, the only herbicide I would use is Roundup. And I would, uh, because Roundup actually, as soon as it hits the ground, goes inert. And after two hours, it dries up and goes inert. And it's not causing problems to our frogs or our dragonflies or our beetles or any of that stuff. Oh, 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 in the prep, yeah, in the prep, you pull, in the prep, you get as much out, you get when, you, in the prep, in the garden preparation, uh, the bed preparation, you pull out as many of the roots as you can that are in that space, unless there's a tree there, then I try to leave the tree roots, of course, but you try to get as much as you can. You're not going to get them all, but you're going to get 90% of them or 80% of them. So is around up the area to begin with, do you think? You can. Yes, so now if you're going to, if you want to do it that way where you want to kill everything because you don't have lawn, you want to kill it, that's fine. What I would do is paint out the stripe around it, 
then I would get the Roundup. Concentrate, don't ever buy, don't, please, don't ever buy and don't tell anyone to use Roundup that's already pre-mixed, ready to be used in a spray bottle. In that pre-mixed spray bottle is surfactant, a soap, and that actually is causing, it's one of the many things that are causing multiple legs on frogs, among other issues, okay? So don't use ready to mix uh, uh, Roundup. Get the concentrated form. Mix it yourself. Then I get out a, um, a paint tray and I pour the Roundup in a paint tray and I get, a, and I get my roller that I'm going to throw away and I rub it into the paint or into the Roundup and I roll backwards out of my garden. The reason why you roll backwards, just like painting a floor, is you don't want any of it on your feet because as soon as you walk back to the house, you have done, you've left dead footprints. I've done it on two million dollar yards in my lifetime. It's so embarrassing. Okay, so do that. So that's my trick. Now. So yes, Roundup's fine, and I don't mind that. Now the other trick is, now that you have your garden and you have a weed infestation because you didn't get them all, um, what I do, or your garden's really old and nobody took care of it and it's weed infested, I put on a rubber glove, and then I put a cloth glove over top of the rubber glove, and I mix up my Roundup, and I dip my hand in the, in the Roundup, and the cloth glove acts as a sponge, and everything you touch dies and everything you don't touch doesn't die. So you can be very selective in your plant kill. So being prejudiced to bellflowers is not a bad thing. Okay? And if you spray, you have a better chance of getting the plants you don't want to kill around it. You can paintbrush too. Yes? Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So if I have, let's say this is, uh, this garden is on a slope that way. So the, the garden slopes like that in real life. And you would take out that garden here and let's put a retaining wall in here. <laughs> so we got it nice and flat. Then you take this soil and you put a dam over here that goes down so that your rain garden is whatever depth that is, okay? Now, in, in reality, looking above, your dam might go <coughs> something like that, okay? I want this spot or this spot or both of them to be the lowest spot along the outside edge. Uh, and that's your outlet. So then you have your boulder wall right there, okay? You see, and so that makes a little more sense. Now, this spot and this spot and this spot are, these two spots might be the same, these two spots are the same, but these spots are higher in elevation by an inch or two than this spot. So that when the water fills up, it goes out this way around your dam, not over the dam. Got it? Make total sense? It's not rocket science, but it's little tricks that help you. And the more tricks you have, the more successful your garden is. So in other words, you don't want a wall thing. Hmm? Oh, you, you, you can. You could. Yeah, yeah. And then you can plant on the dam. You've expanded your garden. Okay. Uh, double shredded mulch, that's kind of what it looks like. Uh, compost. Sizes of plants. These are seedlings. I wouldn't plant them. These are plugs. I would plant them. These are quart-sized pots. I definitely would plant them. I tend to plant more of these plugs, which are inch by inch squares or six packs of plants. I tend to plant those more than anything else. They're cheaper. They're about a buck a piece. And you can get anything you want. 
any kind of plant can, just about any kind of, you can't get hostas or irises or some of those, or peonies, but you can get almost all, and you can't get shrubs in that form, but you can get all the, most of the perennial plants in that form. They're inexpensive, they actually have a higher success rate of survival than the quart size, and the quart size has a higher success rate than the gallon size, and the gallon size have a higher success rate than the two gallon size. What you're doing is you're buying time. This plant is a dollar to two dollars a piece. This plant is four to seven dollars a piece. The gallon pot that is a foot deep and a, six inches across is seven to twelve dollars a piece unless you live in Long Island and it's twelve to twenty dollars a piece. Uh, and, the, and then the, gallon, the two gallon pot, it's, uh, which is about eight inches across and about a foot deep, is, um, is uh, somewhere around 12 to 20 dollars. And what you're doing is you're buying time. The seed, the, this guy is six months old, this is a year old, the next one is a year and a half old, two years old, and what you're doing is you're buying time. But you, the little guys have a higher success rate because they haven't had perfect everything for the last two years. Okay. They're more adaptable. So we're going to walk you through a few more rain gardens. This is a Toro Dingo. Walk behind most of the time. However, you can put an arm on it and you can stand it up, sit, sit on it, or stand on it and, and dig. Uh, you can rent these for about $150 to $200 for a day. And it does a lot of digging really, really fast. <laughs> you can build a rain garden in a half a day. So again, that's working smarter than harder. So anyway, you're pulling out the soil, and he's pulling it out to make a dam, and he's double digging. He's loosening the soil very, very deep. Once he's got the soil loosened and he's got the dam, now, uh, and we've crushed it in so it's harder, he's measuring the depth. So he's measuring the top to the bottom. Okay. and then we mulch and plant. We'll get to edging in a second. <coughs> and of course, after you're done planting, you should really water and smile, because you're done. Keep staying the children away from the house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is the only one that breaks the rules. Um, this is actually a rec center, and it's on a slab. And this distance isn't quite four feet. It's like three, two. But I, this is the only one that breaks the rules. So I don't want to break the rules, but I, in this one I did. Um, edging. Um, I guess I don't have pictures of it. I can't, I didn't think I did. Edging. I always put an edger around my rain gardens, and most people here in the Midwest do. In the East Coast, nobody does. They don't even know what edging is. I don't know why. It's silly to me. So anyway, edging. I like segmented edging. <coughs> segmented edging is anything that is pieces that are anywhere from six inches to a couple feet long. Um, I don't like the long plastic edging or the aluminum edging, the one big segment. The reason for that is all edging gets heaved in the winter. And uh, plastic edging that if you got it going around and it's coming across the grass and it heaves over on this side and gets higher, the water that comes here gets bumped around and goes around your rain garden. Okay, So then you have to push the edging down. And when you push the edging down, they, you have to dig it out and push it physically push it down. So I like the segmented edgers, like brick pavers, bullet edger. Bullet edger you can get at Menards. It's round on one side, rounded on the other side, and they all fit together, and they're a dollar a piece. Okay? And, and then I lay them down. I bury them into the ground so that the top is flush with the ground. So what you want Go over here. 
what you want is that you have this uh, edger into the rain garden straight across so that this is flat and flush with, uh, with, the, with the edge of the garden and then the garden will go down a little bit deeper. Okay. The reason for that is when this heaves up, not if, but when it heaves up, you can take out that one or two bricks, pull them up, take a little dirt out and put them back down and you're done in minutes where it will take you half a day to push down that plastic bullet or plastic edger. Same thing. Yep, it all it all it all moves, and so when it you could you you have a better chance pounding it in. Steel edging is better than plastic edging, but I still like this the best. The other nice thing about this is when you go to mow the grass, you put your you put your uh, you put your wheel of your lawnmower right on the edge. Yeah, that's what I mean. Brick, any of that segmented edging. Brick, patio stone, um, uh, concrete, bullet edging, any of that kind of stuff. And in these fields, do you say they don't use any volunteers? They have day laborers that come in with, uh, um, with a weed whip or an edging tool and cut it. They don't have to do any kind of base under the blocks that you use? No, no. I, in fact, what I do is I get a rubber hammer and I get it, I, I dig it out where I think it's right, I get it in there, and then I use my hammer and pound it in, it, you go really quick. Yeah. Oh, and the, oh yeah, so that's a good point, that, that, air, that bullet edging looks uh, like that. Looking above the ground. It's made out of concrete, and then this piece fits in this piece. It goes around curves great. And it does flush to the ground. Flush to the ground. And the reason why you want it flush to the ground is when the water comes across, it doesn't get hung up on this thing and goes in. What happens with the plastic edging, well, it happens with all edging, but it's especially bad with plastic edging. You got this stake in here, and you got your you gotta still have the rain garden flush with the ground. Uh, so that, or uh, top of the ball flush with, so that the water comes in. But what happens is this gets pushed up, sits up here, it only has to move up a quarter of an inch, and it stops your water from getting into your rain garden. Yes? It's all about aesthetics and, and function of, or ease of mowing which is why the East Coast people cut it. It is, it's a totally Midwest thing. Edging is a totally Midwest thing. It's, sure, it's funny. It's easier for like prevent um, tubing paralysis and invasion. Right, and really what it, the best thing about that edging is it keeps the grass out and the mulch in. That's what it really does. Pipe systems, I want to talk about conveyance and getting water to your gardens. Um, we have a whole bunch of different things. We have dry creek beds or, or trench drains. Um, oh, wait, it's 8 o'clock? Just keep going. Okay. 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 Um, you have uh, in here, I gave you a cross section of a French drain. I gave you a cross section of a, uh, on these two pages, a uh, dry creek bed and a dry creek bed with a bridge. So here's the deal. We want to get the water to that, the, to the garden. And we First, the French drain is literally right here. It's just a trench with a pipe in it that you backfill with rock. So you put rock in here and the water falls into that pipe. The pipe is an infiltration pipe, a pipe with holes in it. So, uh, whoops, I'm going to skip up ahead. Oh, come on. There it is. So, 
what, sorry, there you go. So what you do is you do that trench, 9 to 12 inches wide. You can cut it with a ditch witch or a trencher. And then you put your drain tile in. It's about uh, 6 inches to 12 inches deep. I tend to stick to 9 to 12. And you can put that drain tile in so the water coming off falls through the rocks, get into the pipe and down. If you put this next to the house, what you want to add is a piece of plastic here. And if you do a piece of plastic, what I tend to do is bring the plastic up and over and bury it two inches. So that the water coming across the surface doesn't get under the plastic and gets under and, and, and rushes down that trench under the plastic. So you want to keep it in the trench. Can you use sheet of plastic? And I tend to get landscape plastic because it's a little heavier duty. When I use this is I use this especially at where the drip line of the house is. That works great. If you have a, if you have a house without gutters, put it right there. Water falls on the rock, goes in here, and then I can get it away from the house. Or if I have the Minneapolis lot where it's only 12 to 15 feet between house to house, I will put in a French drain between the homes to get the water away from the side home and bring the water out to the front yard or backyard, whichever is downhill. Into a rain garden. So then this terminates right into the rain garden. So if it terminates into this rain garden, the pipe will come in right in the rain garden itself. Okay. And it daylights in the garden. What I tend to do at the end of the pipe is put in a, a screen to keep the chipmunks out. Okay. And the pipe has to have a slope on it. I like 2%, a 2%, 1% is fine. What that means is that it, in 100 feet, it drops a foot. That's 1%. Steeper is better. Steeper moves the water faster and less likely to slow down or freeze or have a little bump in it or whatever. While you go deep, well, it depends on the slope of the ground. Maybe not. Yes? In the pipe? Yeah. Okay. You buy it that way. Okay. You, don't have, you buy a drain tile that's already pre-made. Pre yes. Don't worry about it. Okay. So now I'm going to go back. So that's that's. Oh, I, it'd be easier. What was that? No, they're all the way around. Yep. And so in the in if you don't line it, water will soak into the ground into that ditch, which is why you need to line it if it's close to the house. Okay. Uh, sort of, but I'll get to it, yeah. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> uh, uh, we also can get the water out to a garden um, with that, that drain tile pipe as well. So, Oh, we'll do French drains. Oh, okay. We're going to do dry creeks beds in a second, but this is a French drain along the edge of the driveway. What the water was doing was sitting right here on the edge of the driveway. We put in a French drain. We brought it out to the back and put a rain garden back here. So we got the water off the driveway and into this rain garden. Okay. Huh? This one was lined. That was lined. Yes, what was bowl? Oh, you can bowl it a little bit. You don't have to because the rock is porous. The rock has lots and lots of holes between the, between the rock. It's, so it's just like thinking about the big jar and you pour the rocks in, then you can pour sand in, and then you can pour water in, and it still keeps coming in. It's the same type of deal. Right, so I tend to give it a little bit of an angle so that if you snow blow or snow plow, you're not pushing the rock around. Absolutely.
in this case. Up against the house, I don't worry about it. Well, this, in this case, the water was going that way. Yeah. Right, it was trying and then stopping and, and, stop, and stopping back here, but there was a, there's a gutter, or there's a ditch in the back of the house that it was trying to get to. But it still carries the water in the winter? Yes, it still runs water in the winter. So um, what happens is it has slope on it, so the water runs through, uh, and excuse me, it runs down that pipe or runs down that ditch, still goes to uh, the garden downhill. Still, it still runs in the wintertime. It doesn't freeze solid. It's long, it, where it freezes is down into the rain garden itself, but the water infiltrates, so you get a skim of, of ice in the rain garden, but if you go and step on it, it's all hollow underneath because the water underneath is infiltrated. So these things work all winter long. You had a question. Yep, you can, right, you can make water go uphill with the trench going deeper, <laughs> further, but it still has to be somewhere, it, ha it still has to have a safe outlet. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it, so I'm going to say you can technically go uphill, but it's difficult. Okay. Most people don't even consider it. I've done it a bunch of times, but most people don't consider it. <laughs> Dry creek beds are... Uh, are you put landscape, you do need landscape fabric for this, and you see how the landscape fabric is um, buried on the ends a little bit, so they kind of do a, a hook. That hook is important so that when the water comes in from the sides, it gets over the landscape fabric and not under the landscape fabric. What a dry creek bed is, is a glorified ditch with rock in it. So you're going to cut a ditch, you're going to put down your fabric, you're going to bury the edge, and then what you're going to do is fill it up with, uh, with rock. One of the things that is in the picture is that I showed uh, a large rock right here. What I tend to do is bury the rock into the soil a little bit so it doesn't look like it's sitting there on top. You make it look like it's part of the system. But that also means that that landscape fabric has to come up and behind that rock, and over, and over, and up and down. Okay. So what I tend to do is I lay the landscape fabric in, but I don't bury the top edge until I got the rock in, so that I could take a little soil out behind and shove a rock in there and make it. It's all about art at that point. Okay. The landscape fabric is important that when the water is running down this ditch, that it doesn't get under it and into the soil and erode the soil. It's protecting it from uh, moving soil. Your lifetime. Because if it, so the only time it deteriorates is when it's in the sun. And if we got rock on top of it, it doesn't get sun. Yep. Yep. That's still a dry creek bed, but it's just maybe not an aesthetic dry creek bed. I tend to have a few big boulders in it and then fill it up between the big boulders with that river rock, that little pebbles stuff. And then what's the purple in there? Or what are the other areas in there? That, uh, the flowers? <coughs> these are flowers. Oh, they are? Yep. These are flowers on the sides. This is the dry creek bed. It's black rock in between limestone pieces. You can mix and match rock. I tend to just stick to one, but you can mix and match. It's, uh, it's, again, it's back to aesthetics. So it's possible also to do a grassy swale, like between my house and my neighbor's house, and just kind of have it graze slightly lower, and then yep. have maybe fescue grass that has better roots or something? Yeah, you can, or sod. You can, yeah. It doesn't, yeah, fescue is no better than, lawn, uh, than Kentucky bluegrass for root depth, but... Okay. The, the, the grass is fine, and grass works just fine. Um, it's just another, you know, so this is more of an aesthetic reason to move that soil, or move that water in the soil. Okay. 
You can do the exact same thing and when you want to cross it, you can put in a bridge. So you can just take a slab of rock and cut it out a little bit on both sides so it sits level, keep that, plastic, or that fabric underneath it so the water still goes underneath the bridge. Okay, so you can do the same thing and if you make that slab somewhere around three inches, you can drive a lawnmower over the top. I mean, one, a, a driving lawnmower can go over the top. If you can go four inches, you can have a golf cart with uh, two uh, or four 500 pound guys on it and you're not gonna break it. Doesn't matter. The, the, it, the four inch thickness is what matters and uh, especially if you do something with granite, the span, well you're never gonna make a span 10 feet or something like that, but if you make a span that is, uh, I've made some that are eight feet, no issues. Except for cost. Oh, and if you do do that, you can get slabs like this at Cold Spring Quarry for like 150 bucks. They're pieces that were going to be granite countertops and they were failures for whatever reason. They throw them in their junk pile. You go on at Cold Spring Quarry in uh, Cold Spring, Minnesota. So you just, if it is already polished, you just turn it upside down and put polished side down. Polished side up is really slippery. There you go. There's, those, there's that. You can see the purple flowers a little better, but here's that dry creek bed. Here's another kind of dry creek bed. Here's a, 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 trench, uh, a, a trench drain to this uh, catch basin down to a rain garden downhill. Uh, yes, it's in there. In the book? No, it's in uh, one of these pages. It's the one that has the side of a house. How about one under a yeah, I'm getting to that in a second here. That one. There's the, there's the catch basin. Looks like that. Okay. Okay. Here's that trench drain. Um, this is a, this is, you're going to end up having to cut it out cut out the pavement with a, with a pavement saw and then buying the trench drain uh, set. And once you have it set, you're going to have to level it, set it, then you're going to pour concrete around it to keep it set uh, all the way along the edge. And you got to, again, keep it so it goes from uphill to downhill to a rain garden. That's the toughest one to do, by the way. Most people don't do this. And at the end of the pipe, of uh, a drain at the house, um, at the other end you want to put some kind of a screen in the rain garden so it daylights in the rain garden to keep the chipmunks from going in. Okay. Also, so long as you put this right next to the house, the radiant heat from your house does not freeze it. It doesn't turn into one big ice block. The further you separate, the, li the more likelihood it's, it freezes, especially in polar vortex years. And there's that section. Okay. So you put it up next to the house, you bury the pipe, and you have it come up in the rain garden. Um, how about the siding and pipe? Four, just four inch pipe. Four inch pipe. Standard, standard pipe. Because if this is a four inch drain tile, I mean a downspout is usually four inch downspout. Four inch drain tile is all you need. I've never sized it any bigger except for at commercial properties. <laughs> yeah, so the box has a spot for holding debris in it, so I, I clean that out once in a while, but if it does start to clog, if you get heavy leaf or um, seeds, you know, maple seeds in there and getting that, all you do is you take off the cover. Uh, you just take off this cover, put in the garden hose, turn it on full blast and just push it through and get it out on the other end. Uh, you got to take off the, the chipmunk screen on the other end to get it out. <laughs> Oh. 
Yep. Yep, yep, you can clog it up. You can get the next size bigger box and replace that box and it would be, be a simple fix. Okay. You're not doing a ton of work. So what you're, what you're doing, if I understand right, you're increasing the amount of water that can get stored in there to get into the yep. 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 How to get the pipe under the sidewalk. How many times have I heard that today? <laughs> Let's do that one. <laughs> so what we're going to do is you're going to put a trench on uh, one side and you're going to get a piece of unperforated uh, white PVC pipe. Two feet longer than the width of your sidewalk. So if your sidewalk's six feet, you want an eight foot piece of pipe. Okay? And unperforated, no holes in it. And you cut a trench. 10 inches to tw uh, 12 inches deep, and you put the pipe in the bottom of the trench. And you line up that pipe against the dirt wall. The reason why you want to go 10 inches or greater is that you have a 4-inch pipe. There is usually uh, 3 inches of concrete and a couple inches of, of, of um, gravel, and you want to be under the gravel. It's called class 5. It's tan. You're going to be able to see the difference so that the top of the pipe is below that gravel. Once you have that set up, that's the hardest part. After you get it set up, the rest goes easy. What you do, it, oh, and then you dig a hole on the other side that you're aiming at. Oh, and here's those concrete uh, pavers, uh, those um, bullet edgers. See how they're level to the ground? And here's two that have been pulled out to get this pipe underneath. So you have a hole that you're aiming at, you put it in, you got it all set up. Once you have it set up, you take your garden hose, you put the garden hose all the way in against the dirt, you turn on the garden hose full blast, and you wiggle the pipe, and the pipe moves. And 15 minutes later, it pops out on the other side. Okay? You will get money, but that's half the fun. That mud has to go somewhere, it comes out the back end as well as pushing around the pipe and that's the lubrication that gets it to move. Okay? Now, uh, occasionally you're going to find a big rock and you're going to need to have your rubber hammer available. Occasionally you find a big rock and you have to give it an encouragement to get through there. I have done this about a hundred times and only one time have I hit a rock big enough that I had to start over. Okay? Now, if you are unlucky to do that, you're one in a hundred and you're really lucky or really unlucky, I'm sorry. There's not much I can help with that. But it works 99 times out of 100. Okay? Then it pops out on the other side. And, what, yeah. <laughs> and when you get on the other side, you just blow it out and hook up the plumbing. You can cut the pavement. And on old pavement, I would do it. On new pavement, I wouldn't do it. It's just a pain in the butt. Yes? If you've got paver sidewalks, would it be worth doing that? No. No, if you've got a paver sidewalk, pick up the pavers out of there, take out that sand, put it in a bucket, take out the class 5, put it down, lay it in, put the class 5 back in, pound it back in, put the sand pavers in and lay the block back in. It takes about the same amount of time. Plants. We're finally to the plants. There's this book out there, I don't know. <laughs> Plant lists. Okay. I gave you a plant list. It is a master plant list. It's a really good plant list because you only see a tenth of what's on that plant list. The original plant list Excel spreadsheet will be on the website. The master plant list has three tabs. Rain Garden Sunny, Rain Garden Shady, Rain garden, native only. <laughs> and there's a lot of duplicates in both lists, but that's okay. Now, what, you're, what I have printed out for you is this right here. That page, it's already set up that when you print, this page prints right here, just like you have it, and nothing more. No more, el nothing else on there. So, underneath, is all the plants that you could put into this to populate this. 
So what we are doing is, this are the plants that you would put in the bottom of the rain garden. These are the plants that you would put in the sides of the rain garden. And these are the plants that we'll put in the front or outsides of the rain garden. I'll get to that in a second. So what you can do is you can grab, cut and paste, pull up here, plug it in, and you have your plant list. Then you just need to uh, number how many plants you want to put in, and you're done. I've made it as simple as possible to give you a plant list that you can create. Then you just need to do a little bit of research. Here's the research. I'm going to get back to 100%. Here's the, here's the plants that all the information that you need to know about these plants. First, scientific name, then common name. If you don't know what these plants look like, take the scientific name, put it into a Google search, and you'll get 15, 20 pictures of that plant. So you can see what the plants look like. Always use the scientific name, not the common name when looking up plants. You're guaranteed to get the right plant because there's a lot of plants that have similar common names. S is for sun, PS is for part sun, SH is for shade. You'll notice that this one doesn't have any SHs, or, or it has S to SH, but it can handle sun to shade, but this is the sunny plant list. Okay. Then the next one is it's a flower, and means it's a native flower. You go down further, a lot further, then you get the shrubs, or grasses, then the ferns, and the shrubs, and the trees. It's a very long plant list. Then it tells you the color of the plant. Uh, so then it, it tells the, is it a flower grass? Then it says what color is the flowers. When it means insignificant, it means there, there's flowers there, but you don't really ever notice them. Okay. And by the way, that is an alpine current, and you'll understand why when you know what an alpine current is. It has flowers, but no, you never really notice. What are the color of the flowers? When does it bloom? By month, five means May, six means June, seven means July. <coughs> it's very understandable. Height, how tall does it get? This is in feet, by the way, so 20 to 25 feet for the pussy willow. Uh, PJM rhododendron compact, three to five, four to six for the normal one. Then after that is some interesting bits about it. So for instance, I have one here that says slow suckers, moist habits, blah, blah, blah. So when it says slow suckers, that means it, has suck it will want to spread by suckers. Okay. Also, when I go back up to the flowers, I will put in here less aggressive than other varieties of this Miss Manners obedient plant. I will never plant obedient plant. You'll notice that it's not in here except for Miss Manners. All the other obedient plants will take over your entire garden, but Miss Manners is less aggressive. It will take over your garden, but it might take a decade to do it instead of a year. Okay? So you have a ton of information there and it's yours for free because I have done this thing so many times this is this is Rusty's by the way this is Rusty's master plant list these are my my plants and everything that I've ever used in a rain garden is in here so the bees and butterflies basically you just look for that keyword and look for bee butterfly bees and butterflies bees and butterflies it says so when it's an important plant for that. Yep. Cool. Yes. Are these zone four? All zone four. This is for Minnesota. Three and four, actually. It's for zones three and four. For Minnesota. When you see them take out the swords and start fighting, <laughs> the guy with the gun wins. Um, no, um, you know what? There's no, uh, that's not quite, uh, there's a few plants that cause diseases to other plants, um, but for the most part, you don't have to worry about them. They will duke it out and figure out who is best, uh, who is more superior. 
but let them do it and don't worry about it. And you know what? There's nothing, when you see aggressive, that's the ones that you kind of have to worry about. And by the way, there's nothing on here that's super aggressive that's going to take over an entire garden, but I have a few that are less aggressive. They will take over a garden in a decade. That's my rule of thumb. Yes, absolutely. No. And here's, and you know why? I don't know the root depth on most plants. And if you know any horticultural student that wants a really good research project, I have a ton. One of which is figuring out the root depth of the cultivars of native plants. I want to know what the root depth is of Purple Dome New England Aster. I want to know the root depth of, of Shenandoah switchgrass. I want to know the root depth on Phantom Joe Pieweed. Nobody knows. I thought that radiant source supply that she has. That's for the natives. Mm -hmm. Then they're not No, they're not. Right. And I don't know the root depths on all the natives. I only know the root depths on a bunch of prairie natives. I would plant plants that can handle the water and not worry about the depth of the roots. Okay, we'll get to the depth of the water here in a second. Okay. Um, I've got a lot of deer. Yeah. I'm wondering if there are some. Uh, some worry about that? Yes, yes. Uh, hostas are, and roses are your worst plants to plant. It's like chocolate to deer. Um, there are plant lists that say these are plants that are deer resistant. There's nothing that is deer proof. Okay. The best thing that I tend to do is get the deer out of your gardens by not letting them in there in the first place with things like fences, ugly, plant skid or other sprays, less ugly but smelly. Or my favorite is a deer scarecrow. It works 100% of the time. And I know it sounds goofy, but it's the best thing in the world. A deer scarecrow is a hawk head about this big around. It stands on a post about three, four feet tall. You put a, a, a garden hose in the back of its head. Its eyes are motion detectors. And its mouth is a big clapping <laughs> sprinkler. <laughs> and it shoots the deer with water. You're doing two things. You're watering your garden and you're scaring away the deer. And it's, when you get hit by it, it's like getting hit with one of those big super soakers. It kind of stings and it's a lot of water. They don't like it, they go away. You keep it on until about June, uh, mid-June, and you can take the batteries out of the back of its head and unhook the hose and now it's a scarecrow and they will not bother your garden. Next spring, you have to hook it all back up again because you have a bunch of young dumb deer and you have to train them. It works. It's 100 bucks to 150 bucks on the internet and it works every time. I've never had anyone ever use it that doesn't work. What's the name of it? Deer Scarecrow. It's a hawk head, but it's, but it's a deer scarecrow. That's what it's called. It looks like a hawk head. It's, it, it looks like a uh, Iowa Hawkeyes hawk. I mean, it's not very pretty. <laughs> It's not a pretty hawk, but that's kind of what it looks like. It's got yellow teeth and the whole works. I mean, it's. How do you know which ones to plant in the, the bottom? I'm going to get to that in a second. I was just curious about um, checking the normal garden capacity of plants when you're in the cold, do you divide? Yeah, yeah. Do you do that? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Gardening, the rest of it, the gardening is just like any other gardening. Dividing, weeding, moving plants. Deadheading, uh, trimming, any of that kind of stuff, depending on how manicured you want it or less manicured you want it, how much maintenance you want to do. Is there a reason you choose natives versus non-natives? Natives tend to have deeper roots and are good for the environment that you have here, but no, you don't have. Pollinating. Um, Used to our cold winters and hot summers, wet springs, dry falls, they're used to it. Less, 
maintenance or less things that you might have to do to keep them alive. Now, I have gardens that are all hosta. Big deal, doesn't matter. And to tell you the truth, when I talk to the homeowner, if they tell me they're a black thumber, I plant hostas and daylilies. You can't kill them. You can't kill them even when you're trying to kill them. Okay? So with daylilies, the roots are so fleshy. Do they, I mean... They still they work. A they lot of water does get through them. Yeah, but it, they're only a foot deep. But that is four times better than lawn grass. Okay? And I got to tell you, a lot of the sedges or the wet watering, the, the plants that you would find in the wetlands have roots that are only that deep also, but they have miles of them. Okay. Okay. So, well, let's get back to the thing. Okay, plant lists. Pretty good. Let's talk about how to pick plants for your area. Um, you should be looking at moisture variance. We'll talk about that in a second. Sun versus shade. Most people kill plants putting shady plants in sun conditions and shady sun plants in shady conditions. In fact, I was helping out a gal today here in Apple Valley that was saying her uh, little blue stem was that they planted last year is dead this year. And I said, so do you have a sunny garden or a shady garden? Well, I put it in the sunniest spot possible how much sun does it get? Like about two, three hours. That's why you killed it. Okay. So, um, so then I gave her a really good plant list of something to put out, something else to put in it, in its place. You can look at uh, pH and soil drainage and things. That's important. It will make a better garden, but it's not the end of the world. Bloom time and color, absolutely. Uh, height and width of the plants. You want to put the tall things in back, short things in front. Wildlife value like butterfly or bird plants is always good. And then purchase availability. Everything that's on my list you can purchase in the Twin Cities metro area. However, a few of them you might have to go to a couple places before you find it. So 90% um, of it is easy to find, but there's a few things that are not as easy to find. No. There's a reason, there's a number of reasons why I don't have orchids on there. So most of them you can't. You can't do. Well, you can't dig them up. You can't. How do you propagate them if you can't get them? Blah blah blah. Okay. Now the soil moisture tolerance. Where to put a garden? So, or where to put them in the garden? The bottom of your garden is your wettest spot, right? Because it's the bottom of the garden. Um, it has the it has the most moisture uh, most moisture issues. So here's what I, I told you before that we're going to change the plants for the moisture regime. Here's how to do that. In the bottom of the garden, in gardens that are nine inches or less deep, we're going to want to use moist, moisture tolerant plants. In the gardens that are uh, 10 inches or greater deep, you're going to want to use average moisture tolerance. Now, I've already given you that in this, in your slide, but if you have a plant that you don't, excuse me, that's, if, uh, if you find a plant, your grandmother's rose, for instance, that is probably not on my list, because I don't know your grandmother's rose, you can get, you can figure it out. Okay, so here's the deal. All plants have a soil moisture tolerance of wet, moist, average, and dry. Wet, moist, average, and dry. And if you take that plant and you do a Google search or you go into a plant catalog, they will tell you it is a wet, moisture tolerant plant, a moist, average, or dry, moisture tolerant plant. Okay? I'm going to now tell you that everything that's in the wet, moisture category, you throw out and you don't use any of them for your rain garden. They're not appropriate for a rain garden. If they say wet, okay. they're not appropriate for your rain garden. Is it? So, for instance, for instance, yeah. Oh no, blue flag iris is moist. Okay. Okay. Blue flag iris is a moist, moisture tolerant plant. But I'm going to tell you all those wet ones you're going to throw out. So, for instance, and you don't want them in there anyway. By the way, cattail, bulrush. Um, 
uh, arrowhead, um, cardinal flower, I'm sorry to say, swamp milkweed, or not, uh, not swamp milkweed, uh, swamp, um, swamp marigolds, yep, thank you, um, or marsh marigolds, um, the same thing, same plant. Um, those are the plants that you'd find in wetlands and want wet, moisture tolerant plants. And if you look, if you look, Minnesota is pretty good, but if you look at other places, uh, four or five times out of ten, the, if, you go on, if you go online and say Minnesota uh, rain garden plants, four out of five, four uh, or five of ten plant lists are bad plant lists that have, that have no business being a rain garden plant list. In most of the other states, it's seven or eight out of ten are no good to you, okay? It needs too much, it needs more water than we are going to provide it. Okay. Now, the cultivar variety could work, but not the native one, okay? The reason for that is the rain gardens are dry in 24 hours or less, okay, on purpose, okay? So now, now that you've figured out, you throw those out, the rest are moist, average, and dry, which is a lot of plants, by the way. So. In the gardens that are shallow, nine inches or less, you can put moist, moisture-tolerant plants in the bottom, like this blue flag iris. But as soon as your garden gets to be 10 inches or greater, you get more sand, the water dries out too fast, this blue flag iris doesn't survive. It's too dry for it. Okay? In sandy conditions, you don't want to try to plant blue flag iris. It just doesn't live. It's too dry. It just peters out. You can put the normal iris in, but not blue flag. Okay. Does your spreadsheet have the moisture tolerance? No, but it does say bottom, sides, or front. Okay. 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 Then, and, and in fact, on the spreadsheet, on the one that you're looking at, it actually, this is broken down. So it, the big spreadsheet underneath says bottom, sides, or front, but up here, this is the bottom, this is the sides, this is the front. Okay. So now, so that's what you're working here. Joe Pie Weed is an average to moist moisture tolerance, so it could be in the bottom for either system. Okay. On the sides up the slope, it is average to dry. Average moisture. Oh, this is wrong. I, and in fact, uh, so, when you look at this later, this is supposed to say dry, not moist. <laughs> I don't know why it says wrong. It's average to dry up the sides because you have less water. So in the shallow gardens, you want to stick to average moisture tolerance. And on the, sh and on the, on the um, uh, deeper gardens, you're gonna, it's going to be more dry quickly, so it'll be more dry plants that you're going to want to put on the edge. That's the sides of the bank or the edge of the garden. The front or outside of the garden is average to dry and you're going to stick to the dry plants. So now I told you about the rows. You have your grandmother's rows. You, find, you figure out what kind of rows that is, you look it up on the internet, that rose is an average moisture tolerant plant. So in the gardens that are nine inches or less deep, you can put that rose on the sides or outside of the garden. However, in the gardens that are deeper, 10 inches or greater, where the water soaks in so fast, you can actually put that rose in the bottom of your rain garden. And you can figure out every plant. I have now given you the tools to figure out any plant that you might want to know about. So if I end up stopping right now, and in 15 minutes I will, you have gotten all the tools that you need. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the moist, moisture tolerant plants in the bottom. And this will be on the web, so you can look at it. So moist, moisture tolerant plants in the bottom, average to up the sides, dry on the outsides for gardens that are nine inches or less. Gardens that are 10 inches or greater, you can do average in the bottom, average to dry up the sides, and dry on the outsides. Okay? Yes? Uh, I'll mispronounce it, but that would be Cachyotis 
Neonicatories, yes. That's easy for everyone else to say. Yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. So I don't know. This is brand new. And I do not know what growers put what on the plants in locally um, or how they grow their plants locally. So I'm not going to I'm not going to say right now. I'm going to let somebody else maybe say more on that. But um, it is I'm going to tell you it's difficult to get. Uh, so what what has happened is uh, neonicotories are ingredients that you put into the soils to grow plants and they grow plants faster. But then the plants take it up, and then it is one of the things that are killing bees. And so that's what you're trying to prevent. Um, I know for a fact that our native plant nurseries grow organically to begin with, and it's not an issue, like dragonfly gardens and landscape alternatives. But I'm not going to say, and I've, I heard that Bachman's just recently put out a note saying that they will be growing that way and will not do it anymore. You have to ask, and but plate. But when you see the pot that says Monrovia on it, that is coming from Portland, Oregon, and I'm going to tell you, I'm pretty sure they're not doing that. If you see the pot that says Bailey's on it, or uh, uh, it, on the pot itself, that's the grower. Then Bailey's has said recently that they are going to. Uh, try to grow all their plants without any neonicotories. I can never say it either. Okay, but they are in the process, and it takes years to get it out of the system. I think the short version is neonic. Right? Neonic, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, they right. They also sell bee friendly. Some places will sell bee friendly, but they sell yeast. Because then the bees get treated like they're going to get the farm. No, it was specifically related to that. Right. So oh, I'm going to suggest a couple plant nurseries, and I'm not by any means getting paid by these companies. These are the places that I went to. I very much love Dragonfly Gardens. It's a hall, it's in Amory, Wisconsin. Okay, but it is a grower and seller of plants, and they have every native, I've never been skunked there. They have every native plant possible that you want to get. Plus, they have all the non-native plants that you would probably want as well. So it's a one-stop shop. No other place is so much a one-stop shop. Uh, trees, trees and shrubs? Plugs, a uh, plugs. No, they were bare root. They were like they had ginger root. Oh, okay. So no, they don't sell it that way. They sell plugs, okay. and you can and the six pack of plugs is about seventy five cents a plant. So whatever, seventy five times six, whatever that is, two bucks, two fifty a plat up 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 a cell pack. Seventy five, sixty five to seventy five cents a plant. I don't know how you get cheaper than that. Okay, so that's worth it. Landscape alternatives, same. Prairie restorations, same. Oops. Uh, landscape alternatives is slightly more expensive than dragonfly. Prairie restorations is slightly more expensive than al landscape alternatives. Uh, that's uh, not maple plain ham. Yeah, nat natural shores, uh, natural shores technology also has a ton of plants over on this side of town, or this you know the west side of town, and applied ecological services or prairie you know what is it prior lake nursery no spring lake nursery, in the south uh, west of the cities also has great plants, and I don't know their prices anymore but they were 
similarly priced to Dragonfly and Landscape Alternatives last time I worked with them. Right. And basically Well, and I'm going to tell you right now, I, I'll give you a really good story. On Long Island, impatience have a disease. You got it here now too? Okay. Impatience have a disease and no growers in Long Island, no nurseries, no growers in Long Island sell impatience. You can get New Guinea impatience, but not regular impatience. And, uh, and that kind of ticks off a lot of people because it's like the biggest standby plant for shade that there is. Um, but uh, you can still get impatience at Home Depot. And what that is doing is uh, every time somebody plants an impatient, you're keeping the virus bacteria on the area and killing more plants. And the it took England seven years to get rid of that disease. We were hoping to get rid of it in three or four, but I think places like Home Depot and those and are going to kill us and make it even longer than England. Okay, so I would never go there. That's just and they only come from four nurseries in Missouri, Kentucky, Arkansas, and someplace else. I can't remember where the fourth is, and they only grow for them. The other issue is those nurseries that grow for Home Depot. They might have a thousand service berries in their yard, and they've sold off 800 of them uh, for other things. And then they take the leftovers, <laughs> the last 200, and which are the weakest plants usually because nobody else wanted them, and then they send them out to Home Depot. There's a reason why they're cheap. So please don't use them. And that's just speaking from a very biased nursery guy right now. Natural Shores Technology. It's in Maple Plain. And Spring Lake Nursery in Prior Lake. Okay. Natural Technology probably get theirs from Prairie Moon? Yes, they get most of their plants from Prairie Moon and grow them up. And Prairie Moon's great in Winona if you, that's just as far as Dragonfly Garden, so it's worth the trip sometimes. So. Uh, plants, I'm just going to go through them quick. Um, you know what? Everything is written down in here well of what the plant is. Woody plant, it's a shrub, uh, red twig dogwood, and some color. Um, also, I have tried to put, uh, I guess I didn't do the shrubs, but I tried to do tall, wet grass, things like that. Okay, so I'm going to just leave it at that. Go through it as you wish. But I want to do one last thing. Is I want to talk, one last thing is I want to talk about the cultivars, what the difference between a native and a cultivar is. So for instance, Purple Dome New England Aster is a cultivar of New England Aster. And what you do is you look at the scientific name. If the scientific name, for the most part, says Aster Nova Anglae or Aster um, uh, Cervitica or whatever. Some, if it has just two names, that is a native plant. As soon as you see a parentheses and another name, it's not native anymore. It's a cultivar. If you see an X in here anywhere in the scientific name, it's a hybrid. Okay. Difference between a cultivar and a hybrid. A hybrid is you take two different kinds of species, you grow them together, and you make a whole new species, that's a hybrid. A cultivar is, uh, I'm going to do purple, uh, purple coneflower. If this room was all purple coneflower and nothing else, native purple coneflower, it would be some purples, some light pinks, some whites, some big, some short, some robust, some thin. They're just, every plant is different. Just like we are all different. Red hair, uh, dark hair, blonde hair, whatever, okay? And eyes and all that, okay? So they're all different. What a grower did is, uh, a science dude, he took two plants, he, he found something that he liked in that field. Let's say he likes the white color 
of the purple coneflower. And he took it and he bred it with all the only white ones. He brought it into a lab. He just kept growing it until he got a consistent plant coming out, same size, same shape, white flowers every time, and then he named it. He called it white swan purple coneflower. So it would be uh, um, Echinacea purpurea, quotations, white swan. That is a cultivar of the original. By gaining something, you lose something. By gaining the white swan feature, he lost some of the depth of the roots. By gaining this very beautiful purple dome New England aster that stays squat, stays round, never stays in a dome, doesn't spread, doesn't tip over, you lost its nectar. No bees come to this. Okay? However, it's a beautiful plant. It's not a bad plant. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't have all the quantity, qualities that you like. Okay? So, whenever you do a cultivar, it doesn't mean it's a bad plant. It just has been manipulated, and you might like the characteristics that it has, but you lost something in the process, and we don't know what we lost most of the time. Okay? So I tend to lean towards native, but you don't have to be native. Okay, I'm totally out of time. We're five minutes to nine. But you've gotten everything that you want, uh, or that everything that I really had to tell you, you've been told.